In order for me to tell you about this, you're going to need to know a little bit about Clint Rockwell first. Now, I've known him for about eight years. He was always strange, to say the least. But not in the sense that made him an outcast. The opposite, actually. I guess strange wasn't the right word. Let's call him exceptional. If I were to give you a quick rundown of his life, it looks something like this. Straight A's from primary to post-secondary, full rides to Ivy Leagues, internship offers out the ass after just his undergraduate year, astonishingly charismatic and handsome, it was to the point where nobody even seemed to be bitter towards him. Not jealous either, they just admired him. But despite all the parties he was invited to, all the attempts at friendship, all the girls that threw themselves at him, he chose to be a loner. In fact, I was one of the only people he talked to. Couldn't tell you why he chose me as an acquaintance. He just did, and let me tell you, I was about as average as average gets, set for a life of mundanity. It all started in 7th grade. I just failed a geometry test. To be fair, I didn't really study for it, but whatever. Clint was sitting right by me. I saw him take one disaffected glance at his paper before putting it down. He got 100, of course. I guess he saw me staring because he looked down at my paper and chuckled. It was slightly embarrassing, of course. But instead of hurling an insult, he asked me if I had wanted to come over after school and study. Maybe play some video games. So, I agreed. That's when I started to get a glimpse into his ideals. You see, he was never satisfied with anything. I remember our conversations regarding what we wanted to do in the future. I had all the generic answers, buy a Lamborghini, a big house in Hollywood, marry Megan Fox. Yeah, I was that asshole. But Clint, he wanted something different. He had bigger aspirations. Adventure, he told me. Going somewhere uncharted, discovering something new, you know? Something that nobody's seen. At that time, I didn't know what he meant. What, like Jupiter or some crap? I asked him. He just chuckled. Maybe, something like that. At that time, I couldn't fathom why he would want to go into space. Nothing's up there, I told him. What's the point? He just gave me an amused look. But it wasn't one of contentious superiority. He wasn't like that. He knew that I couldn't have understood, but he didn't fault me for it. Well, think about it. People's lives have become lackluster, he went on. When we have all the comforts in the world, everything turns into structure, routine, nothing new. Our destiny decided by the time we're out of college. Who the hell wants to get caught up in the rat race and just chase monotony day to day? That's the worst possible outcome. Look, that's why we watch movies and read books. Escapism. Looking for stories that are infinitely more satisfying than the one we're living in. I mean, what do we really have to look forward to? He talked a lot like this, but it didn't sound suicidal. It was something else. This guy beyond was driven. I could see it. But to be honest, I couldn't tell you what he did in the long hours he spent in his room alone. He never talked about it. By the time he went off to Caltech and I went to Penn State, we started drifting apart. In fact, after the first year of his master's degree, he stopped talking to me completely. Stopped talking to anybody, actually. When he didn't go home for spring break, his folks called cops. Apparently, he'd stopped going to class as well. They looked for him, but there were no traces. It was a cold case going nowhere. However, I do remember the last time we had communicated. He'd send me a Facebook message. This is all that it said. Do you want to be part of something? It's a project I'm working on. I can explain more later. I'd sent him a message asking about specifics, but he never responded. That was the last I'd heard of him for about seven years. That was before he knocked on my door in the middle of the night some hours ago. I wasn't going to open up at first. These kinds of stories never end well. However, that's when I heard my name being called by a distantly familiar voice. I couldn't believe my ears. I stared through the people at what looked like a homeless man. He had dirty, tattered clothes, a mass of a beard, and a generally unkempt appearance. But I recognized those eyes instantly. I recognized that spark. It was Clint. I opened up and greeted him in disbelief. But before I could pelt him with questions, he stopped me. Look, don't freak out. I'll explain everything. Maybe let me shower first, though. He flashed his award-winning smile at me, though his pearly whites weren't what they used to be. It's really good to see you, by the way. That's when I got a closer look at his frame. He was bigger than I'd remembered. Bulkier. Looked like he'd put on 10 pounds of muscle. His model-like face was now weather-beaten and covered in scars. He also smelled of sweat and grime. This was absolutely insane, to say the least. After he washed up and settled into a couch, he laid it all out. 
I'm going to tell you what he told me verbatim. Apparently during the latter half of his undergraduate year, he was approached by his physics professor, Joel Rust, a somewhat eccentric 42-year-old, but he was supposedly brilliant. Rust had chosen Clint specifically to partake in what he called a research project. He laughed when he told me this. We had to call it that, he said. If they knew what we were really doing, the funding would have been gone. There were 14 other people involved in this. Two theoretical physicists, three cosmologists, two young thrill-seekers, two ex-Navy SEALs, a discharged U.S. soldier, an archaeologist, a retired MMA fighter, a disgraced entrepreneur, and a suicidal drifter Russ found trying to jump off a bridge. It was a strange group for sure. But we all shared similar ideals, he explained. For one reason or another, we were all looking to get away from this world, looking for another frontier. Apparently, while on vacation, Rust had discovered something peculiar off a remote coast on the South Islands in New Zealand. Something over the Cook Strait. Rust explained that he'd been seeing some kind of strange, thick fog that hung under the clouds. We didn't know what he meant by that, Clint stated. He never really explained it. For years, he'd spend his summers out there and observe it himself. He'd then spend every second of his free time analyzing his observations. Eventually, he'd enlisted the help of some cosmologists and other physicists. Clint looked at me. It seemed as if he was having trouble holding in a huge grin. You know what the theory they came to was? I shook my head. It was a passage to somewhere else. A different universe, so to speak. This floored me. I was skeptical for about a second, but then I thought about who I was talking to and how strange this whole situation was. I just kept listening. I asked him how they'd figured that out. You want the details? He replied. I thought about, no, not really. Science was never my strong point. Anyhow, he told me how Rust had started conducting experiments. He'd fly a drone into the fog whenever a storm was brewing. Those were the only times where it was visible. He estimated that after it disappeared, there would be about a three minute window where he could control it. After that, it was gone forever. That's why we needed the funding, Clint explained. This crap was expensive. The culmination of all these experiments and all this research was supposed to be a trip into the fog, just to see what they would find. That's when Russ started forming the team. It took a while, but he eventually gathered together people he deemed would be fit for something like this, along with the other researchers involved. He said that he chose me because of an essay I wrote for class. The topic was about what the universe meant to us as individuals, Clint said. I guess it spoke to him. I'm sure he had other reasons as well, he smirked to himself. Now, while the ex-military and thrill-seekers were all in good shape, Rust and the researchers weren't. Nobody knew what to expect, really. That's why we had to train. Cardio, strength, agility, the works. Nobody wanted to lag behind, Clint elaborated. After about three years, they deemed themselves ready to go. The big day was finally there, on a warm spring day in California and a particularly choppy one on the South Islands. Rust, Clint, and the rest of the team piled into a private plane owned by the entrepreneur. They brought with them months' worths of rations, weapons, first aid kits, and research equipment. Parachutes as well, just in case. Everything you could think of. Funnily enough, the drifter was the only person who knew how to pilot. I remember thinking that this was bat crap. Wait, I asked him. So you guys were just going through this? Was nobody scared of what could happen? He just chuckled. So we have a bunch of insane researchers, soldiers scarred by combat, thrill seekers, a suicidal guy, don't even get me started on myself. And you think we gave a crap? <laughs> no, I guess we weren't. As it turns out, they figured out what Russ was talking about when they got close to this thing. Apparently, the fog was dark gray, almost black. It was maybe 100 meters below the clouds, and it was massive. The strangest part was that it didn't move at all, and you could clearly tell where it began and where it ended. Everybody braced themselves upon entering. They were suddenly submerged into darkness. Clint said that they could see the silhouette of anticipation on everybody's faces from the faint cabin lights. After three minutes, the plane starts malfunctioning. Here's the screwed up part. Russ never actually told anybody about the drone experiments until afterwards. So when this happened, everybody started freaking out. Nobody was expecting it. But soon after, a wave of light filled the plane. What they saw with the windows was incomprehensible. A dark, foreboding landscape. Heavy rain pounded the windows while a cacophony of violent lightning bolts struck around them. To make matters worse, the plane was headed down, into a black ocean beneath. As they got closer, they could tell that there was definitely movement in the water. Large movements. 
and they weren't just waves. Luckily for them, the plane was also on a trajectory for a landmass up ahead. Nobody asked any questions. They just stuffed their bags with weapons, rations, and water before hastily strapping on their parachutes. It was at this point where they realized military training would have come in handy. Right then, it was every man for themselves. Once the plane was nearly over the island, everybody started jumping out. A good portion of the team didn't get so lucky. Other than Rust, only one of the researchers survived. Two of them couldn't open their parachutes in time. One landed in the water, where he was quickly consumed by something. And one got struck by lightning on the way down. The entrepreneur and one of the ex-seals also didn't make it, both landing rough on the rocky shoreline. The team was suddenly down to ten. They watched as the plane spiraled out of control into the murky sea. The fog was also still visible in the distance, just hanging there. After they regrouped, they just sat in silence for a while. Nobody knew what to think. Russ's theory looked to be right, it seemed. The island itself was pretty similar to tropical ones you would find here on Earth, except for the trees, as tall as apartment complexes, and the fact that the sky was always cloudy. They'd later find out that this place had a name, Dusk Blue. Another peculiar thing was that the lightning never seemed to strike land, only the ocean. Good news for them. They started by making their way into the jungle in front of them. With nowhere else to go, this is all they could do. Amongst them, they had managed to take six pistols, four machetes, an assault rifle, and a shotgun. No reserve ammunition, though. They had also concluded that they had about five days of food and water for all of them. As they made their way across the land, some creepy, unexplainable crap started happening. The MMA fighter, they called him Duke, went to go piss in some bushes at one point. About 30 seconds later, he ran back to the group, freaked out and hyperventilating. Everybody tried asking him what had happened. That's when they looked at the clearing he had came from. Duke was standing right there with a blank expression plastered on his face. Buddy was also with them. Then, out of nowhere, his copy began sprinting backwards into the woods at a torrid pace. Another occurrence took place when they came across what looked like a void just floating in the air in front of them. It was literally a door-sized black shape that was devoid of anything. One of the thrill-seekers, Jeff, stuck his hand into it for a few seconds before pulling it back. He could still move it, but he'd become completely numb. It stayed that way. Apparently one night, they woke up to the sound of shells blasting in the air. Lauren, the archaeologist, was shooting at something just a few meters away from where they were sleeping. Clint said it was hard to describe, something along the lines of a massive spider-human hybrid. The shotgun didn't affect it, it just crawled away. God, this sounds like a freaking nightmare. Is this what you wanted? I asked him, I was sincerely curious. I mean, yeah, this is exactly what I needed. His words sounded genuine. I guess it didn't matter that I couldn't understand him. He understood himself. He went on. Three days pass and they're still in the jungle. They didn't know where they were heading, but nobody wanted to admit that. Rust and the cosmologist continuously record their observations while everybody else is getting antsy. They were running out of food. The other thrill-seeker Clint forgot his name, was starting to go delirious. They'd seen a small creature that vaguely resembled a chicken and he tried attacking it with a machete. Unfortunately, his throat was instantly slit upon making contact with it. Nobody went near any wildlife after that. It looked like hunting for food was now out of the question. Urgency was setting in. At night, they'd start hearing horrific, unrecognizable sounds all around them. One time they woke up to see a pale humanoid creature with no facial features sitting cross-legged just a few meters away. Suddenly, the skin on its head peeled back to reveal a singular, monstrous-sized eye. It only needed to blink one more time before everybody got the hell out of there. They had also come across a strange hole in the ground at one point. It was about the size of a basketball. The other ex-seal name, also forgotten, walked up to it to take a look. Cautiously, he peered into it. About a minute passes and he still hadn't moved. People started shouting at him to just leave it, but he ignored everything. They tried prying him away, but he didn't budge. He just stayed crouched, eyes blankly transfixed on the hole. After about ten minutes, they left him. Things were reaching a tipping point once the fifth day came. They were starving, sleep-deprived, and paranoid. With only four MREs left for the eight of them, they needed to conserve energy. However, every time they stopped to rest, they'd hear footsteps behind them. They'd look for the source, but there was nothing visible to be found. The steps would just get louder and louder. Eventually, they'd caught up. Clint said that they could hear something running quick circles around them before he started to feel lightheaded. The last thing that he remembered hearing before passing out was a barrage of shouts coming from somewhere in front of them. 
none of them voices that he'd recognized. He awoke some time later, lying on a stiff mattress in a small wood cabin. His head was pounding and his face was covered in dried blood when he touched it. He looked around the room, nearly jumping out of his skin when he saw somebody sharpening some kind of weapon in the corner, but he did look to be human, resembling a Mediterranean man. Upon seeing Clint wake, he'd got up and introduced himself as Slade. He also spoke English, albeit it was in a strange accent that Clint said he'd never heard before. Now, Clint was no small guy at 6'1", but Slade still towered over him. He'd explained that he was essentially a guard protecting a walled civilization called Pharaoh Locus, where Clint currently was. He described how he and the rest of the team had come into contact with the, what the locals referred to as stalkers. They'd eventually managed to fend them off, bringing Clint and the rest to safety. They were happy to let them stay, as long as they did fair share of work. He further explained the island that they were on. As it turns out, Dusk of Blue was actually one of the few places in that world that had a semblance of order and society. While most of it was still extremely hostile, there were protected settlements set up all around, where people could live in relative peace. However, the main attraction was at the center, a massive, self-governing city-state known as Paradise X. While settlements like Pharaoh Locus could be compared to small towns in the Old West, Paradise X was more comparable to a modern-day metropolis. He went on to explain a strange trend in births on the island in which around 1 in 1,000 children were born with enhanced levels of strength, speed, and nearly impenetrable skin. Officials from Paradise X would come around to the settlements every now and then in order to recruit these children into the security force set to protect their borders. In exchange, their families would be allowed citizenship and a place to live within the city. Of course, everybody was after this. This resulted in a lot of questionable moral decisions when it came to children. Clint then asked about all the stuff that had happened before they were rescued. All the weird crap. Apparently Slade just sighed and told him not to worry about it. He didn't have the answers either. That stuff's always been there and it was better not to think about it. He told him to simply stay inside the settlement and not cause any trouble. The punishment for disorderly conduct was exile. I was still trying to wrap my head around any of this. When Clint started yawning, he told me that he was tired and that we could talk in the morning. I tried to get him to stay up and tell me more, but his eyes were already halfway closed. I've gone through some messed up crap, man. Let's just rest for a bit. Don't worry, I've got more to tell you. Spend seven years over there, for goodness sake. He said drowsily. Yeah, fine. You can take the guest room, I told him. After feeding him some leftover spaghetti, I led him up there. I had to ask him one more thing before he passed out, though. What about your folks? How the hell are you going to explain this to them? He paused for a second before speaking. Uh, couldn't if I tried. They're gone, man. To be honest, the lack of emotion in his voice disturbed me a bit. Oh, crap. I'm... I'm sorry, was all I could utter out. He just let out a forced chuckle and said, What are you sorry for? You didn't do anything. Before disappearing into the bedroom. That's when I really thought about what had just happened. If Clint's been telling me the truth, then that's horrifying to think about. I guess I'll write another update when he wakes up. So, it's currently morning. I didn't expect to get much sleep last night, and I didn't. We just picked up some breakfast. Clint's been eating like an animal. Guess I can't blame him, though, but I don't want to get off topic. He followed up by describing a rough layout of the world beyond that island. By his account, oceans made up of 85% of the surface. There were only two continents. Well, there used to be three, but one was essentially annihilated and made unlivable by a previous world war. There were also islands scattered throughout, ones like Dusk Blue, the two remaining continents known as Neo Civitas and Heaven's Curse. I'll discuss the latter first. Clint estimated that he'd spent around two months there, but that's another story. To put it simply, it resembled an apocalyptic crap show with the vast majority of it being a desert wasteland. If you thought Dusk Blue sounded bad, this crap was something else entirely, Clint explained. Apparently, the life expectancy for children born there was around six human years. The places where people lived ranged from lawless zones controlled by warlords to totalitarian fortresses and everything in between. It had a total population of 17 billion, living in an area about twice the size of Russia. And those were only what we could consider to be humans. The place was also filled with some of the most incomprehensibly horrific things he'd seen. Any place that wasn't occupied by a majority of humans was simply referred to as oblivion. 
If you went out into those places alone, you weren't going to last long. Now the creatures that dwelled within Oblivion were a bit tough to explain. Clint's experiences with them were limited. However, he'd heard that people had stopped trying to label them all. There were simply too many. He told me about some of the more infamous ones. Harbingers. These were giant winged monstrosities with sharp spikes protruding out of every inch of its body. You could barely see their skin, and even the heads were mostly covered. These things were massive, about the size of a large shuttle bus. It was rumored that the spikes coming out of their skin put them in a constant agonizing pain. Because of this, they were in a constant state of rage, slaughtering anything that moved. They were called Harbingers because whenever one arrived, many others were soon to follow. That meant unavoidable, mass-scale death and destruction. These things weren't easy to kill, and people had to prepare. Butcher Knights. Nobody really knows what these are. A theory floating around was that they were members of an ancient order of knights that had been condemned by some otherworldly being. They were now forced to roam heaven's curse for eternity, searching for human flesh to eat. Yes, they ate people. In appearance, they were ten-foot-tall humanoids covered head to toe in crude black armor, resembling that of a traditional knight. Upon close inspection, it almost seemed as if the armor was welded to their skin, which appeared to be rotting. They'd attack human outposts with extremely large, rusted pikes and axes. If the initial blow didn't kill you, the ensuing infection sure would. Fighting them one-on-one -on -one wasn't an option, as they could easily overpower multiple humans at once. Steam cannons had to be used to take them out. Weeping Infernos These were also humanoid in nature. Despite always being covered in fire, they rode on top of unidentifiable creatures. They almost looked like horses, except for the fact that they had six legs and ran at ludicrous speeds. It's unclear if the riders are physically attached to the creatures, as they seem to have their own legs, but have never been seen to dismount. The way that they kill is actually not what you'd think. While the constant stream of flames that burst out of their bodies was certainly a cause for concern, a bigger problem was their persistent, ungodly shrieks. If you got too close to them, your brain would eventually explode. That's where they got their names from. The Hunter. This one was rare. People were unsure if there was only one of these, or if there were more. This stems from the fact that it only ever appeared by itself, but that didn't mean it was easy to deal with. Supposedly this thing was seemingly indestructible, until proven otherwise, that is. But so far, nobody's made a dent in it. However, it was only really pursuing one thing, the strongest entity in the surrounding area. Somehow it could sense them. That meant the more settlements would try and protect their most capable fighters, the more people would die when the hunter tried to get to them. Eventually, communities would just give them up and hand them over whenever he came around. They'd fight each other, and the hunter would always win. Most reports of its appearance may have been falsified, since so little people have actually seen it. However, the most agreed upon one was a being more than triple the size of a butcher knight. It had no legs, but about twelve arms that it used to attack and move. Its hands were large, covered in a caustic liquid and could grab a human, simultaneously crushing and dissolving them in seconds. It also apparently had no face, just a large mouth filled with sharp black teeth on its torso. Ultimately, these only scratched the surface. Heaven's curse was like the ocean, mostly unexplored and the vast majority of creatures dwelling within it still undiscovered. This was probably good. However, these weren't the only things that the inhabitants had to worry about. There was also a perplexing phenomenon that seemed to plague everybody who lived there. Nobody could explain it away. Nobody could identify the source, and nobody even knew what to call it. They just accepted it. A good parallel for this in our reality would be the glitches in the Matrix some people experience. On Heaven's Curse, you could be simply walking around before getting disoriented for a second. When you'd come to your senses, you'd find yourself standing outside the civilization you were just in. Out in oblivion. People also claimed to see things that weren't there, hear things that didn't have a source, and be having conversations before realizing that there was nobody in front of them. One of the most extreme cases were times where everybody around you would stop in place, have all their heads twist to look directly at you, and then their lips would stretch ear to ear in the most horrific grin you'd ever seen. After a couple of seconds, everything would go back to normal. Nobody would say they'd ever even remember doing so. This happened to Clint once. You may be wondering how there could still be a constant population of 17 billion considering all of this. Well, there was one thing that people living there didn't have to worry about. 
That was sustenance. Now Clint admitted that the food they had to eat wasn't very good, but it was abundant. The bark on trees was nutritionally dense, rain came regularly and didn't have to be boiled to drink, and various, albeit strange, looking root vegetables could be grown almost everywhere, with shortages being unheard of. Additionally, these medium-sized insects called salvators were rampant all around, but they were never a nuisance, never seemed to spread disease, and if cooked, could be used as a great source of protein. That's why there were so many people. Children were being bred at a torrid rate, emotional connection to your offspring wasn't really a thing, and the ones that survived attacks by the oblivion creatures would be trained to deal with subsequent assaults. Since food wasn't an issue, the more there were, the better chances a settlement would survive. However, the population always seemed to even itself out. The climate was also favorable. While the north and south ends of the continent had extreme temperatures, nobody really lived there. In fact, nobody knows what lives there. The rest of it could probably be compared to Australia. Pretty hot, but still livable. There were no seasons, and the sky was perpetually covered in what looked like an orange haze. So sunburn wasn't an issue. With that said, everybody still wanted to get the hell out of there. The quality of life was still absolute crap. They all wanted to reach Neo Civitas, which they nicknamed Heaven's Promise. And that was pretty much impossible, given the fact that they were separated by as much ocean as the geography would allow. Now, Clint had never actually been inside Neo Civitas. He'd only heard about it in red descriptions. Supposedly it was only a tenth the size of Heaven's Curse, and it was named after the only city on the entire continent. Clint said that a physical description of the place would be akin to Manhattan on steroids, a megacity that was host to a population of 275 million. It was a continuous stretch of brilliant buildings and skyscrapers that lit up the night. It was also a functioning society. People had jobs, could start families, and could engage in recreational activities. Nobody had to worry about anything beyond crap like taxes and public opinion. It sounded like the rat race all over again, Clint exclaimed. While the area outside the city limits was still somewhat hostile, it was nowhere near the extent of Heaven's Curse, or anywhere else for that matter. Besides, there was a monumental metal-based wall about 400 meters tall surrounding the entire place. There were also heavily armed military personnel called Apex Officers guarding it. In fact, a lot of it was comprised of the enhanced soldiers guarding Paradise X. These two places actually had an agreement where a portion of the ex-soldiers would be flown from Dusk Blue to Neo Civitas in exchange for firearms. And yes, they were the only ones who had access to air travel. They were also widely believed to be the sole producers of guns and ammunition. Resources were scarce in this world, and most of them were on Neo Civitas. The few other resource-rich islands around the world were essentially picked dry by recon teams sent by the government. This was that world's only superpower. They called all the shots, and went unopposed in doing so. However, there was one thing that they did have to worry about. You see, there was one thing that Neo Civitas had in common with everywhere else. The sky. It was always cloudy. Nobody could come up with a tangible explanation of why. It was always just like that. Well, that's just what those people think, Clint remarked quickly. Strangely, he didn't elaborate on that. That's when I really noticed how weird he'd been acting the whole time he'd been telling me this. There was an increasing urgency in his tone. Anyhow, he went on. Apparently there was a legend of sorts that had permeated every community all around the world. When the day comes when the clouds finally part, true Armageddon will soon come to fruition. And nobody could stop it. I'd been so caught up in this that I'd forgotten I actually had work that day. My boss had texted me in the morning telling me I had to come in later, just for a few hours. I was already late. Crap, I told Clint. Look, I gotta run to work quickly. Uh, just stay here, alright? Don't go anywhere. I'll bring back some pizza or something. He responded almost instantly. Yeah, do what you gotta do. I'll be here. He said this in the same urgent tone he'd been using before. However, I didn't think anything of it. I'm currently at work now, but I can't focus on anything. There were still too many things that Clint had left unexplained. I just came back and he's gone. I somewhat expected this. It seems that he took a bunch of perishable rations, a few sets of my clothes, a laptop, and some cash. However, I did find something on the kitchen counter. It was an old, crusty journal, covered in dirt and bloodstains. There was also a sticky note attached to it, and this is what it read. I'm sorry, James. You've always been of the few people that I could actually bear talking to. Maybe you'll understand eventually. 
This journal should answer some of the questions that you still have. In the meantime, there's something I need to do. Bye for now. Clint. P.S. I'll pay you back sometime. You know I will. I smiled at that. It was true. He'd always kept his word. Deep down, I knew that his stay here wasn't going to last long. He just wasn't that kind of guy. Whatever he's doing, I hope he succeeds. In the meantime, it looks like I'm going to have some reading to do. Let's see what this is really all about. Hi again. My posts to come may be a bit sporadic. Work's got me on my heels. You know how it is. As much as I want answers, I also need to eat. Nonetheless, I've started reading the journal. I'll list the names of the people Clint arrived with before I start typing it out. The ones who were still alive at the beginning of the first entry, that is. Just to make it less confusing. There was Clint, and Rust of course, and then Duke, the MMA fighter, Lauren, archaeologist, Travis, the drifter, Christian, discharged soldier, Hawkins, cosmologist, Kaganori, thrill seeker. Anyhow, here we go. Entry 1. I thought I'd write down my thoughts as well as any significant events while I'm here. Now, I'm not sure who this is for or who's even going to read it, but I might as well do this. My name is Clint Rockwell and I'm currently in some strange world that isn't Earth. How'd I get here? Well, that's a bit too much to explain here. We've been on Dusk Blue, the island we first landed on, for around two months now. That is assuming time passes the same here as it does on Earth, and I think it does. Or close enough, anyways. Hawkins estimates that the time between days here is around 23 hours and 48 minutes. I kid you not. The guy sat there and counted the seconds one day. He's pretty much gone crazy at this point. Can't really blame him, though. This must be freaking insane for him. Besides that, everybody's being pretty nice around here. All seem to be genuinely good people. Once you get past the cultural differences, that is. Apparently a handshake here means war. But, I don't know. Maybe there's something wrong with me. For the first week, I was amazed by this place. But after that, crap kind of fell into routine again. The satisfaction that came from making this discovery has been dwindling. It's just day after day of manual labor. Eating gruel and sitting around. The thing I didn't realize was that nobody ever goes outside this place unless they deem it to be a direct threat worth intervening in. Hell, the only reason they bothered saving us was because we were leading the stalkers directly to them. There's really nothing to do here. However, the stories I hear from the elders were pretty interesting. For example, some time ago, they found a dead body lying just outside the settlement walls. Not wanting it to stink up the place, some guys carried it away and threw it in some foliage. That night, they heard somebody yelling at around the same place they found the body. When they checked it out, it was the same dead guy from earlier. Except he was alive and didn't have a scratch on him. They didn't let him in, obviously. You see, while crap like this would encourage most people to stay within the safer confines of the settlement, it just didn't have the same effect on me. Crap like this made me want to get out there, made me want to go explore. I realized that we almost died on the way here, but we were also unprepared. With people who know their way around, it could work out. You know, you can't wave a piece of meat in front of a lion and expect it to stay in the cage. Alright, well, that was dumb as hell and I wish that I didn't write it down. But I don't have any racer right now, so I guess that's staying in. Maybe I'll figure something out. Entry 2 An opportunity arose just now. One of the guards here, Grillo, approached me yesterday. Apparently a convoy from Paradise X is coming around tomorrow to pick up any enhanced children. Now, there aren't actually any here, but this was his plan. As soon as they came, we would tell them that we had some. We would lead them into one of the cabins and ambush them inside, while somebody else took out the drivers. I asked him how the hell we were going to do that, since they had guns. But we do too, he responded with a toothy grin. That's when I realized we did, didn't we? Apparently, Paradise X goes off the assumption that nobody at any settlement possesses firearms since gunpowder is pretty much unavailable on the whole island. The only reason Paradise X has them is because of a trade deal they do with some other place or something. Now, I've never done something like this, and I don't know if I ever really feel comfortable doing so, but this seems like the only way I'm getting out of here. Still, I'm not killing anybody. Grillo also told me not to tell Slade, as it wouldn't go down well with him because of past incidents. Entry 3 Grillo and I have worked it out. He's got two other guards in on this, and I've convinced Duke, Christian, and Kaganori. It didn't take much. They were all itching to get out of here as well. However, Lauren wasn't so sure about it. 
Maybe she'll come around. Russ said hell no when I brought it up, and I'm pretty sure Hawkins is actually going insane because he just ignored everything I said. As for Travis, well, he actually seems really happy here. I saw him smile for the first time when a little girl made him a wooden necklace. I'm not going to bother him. All I know is that this is happening, and no matter the outcome, at least I've done something few others have. Entry 4 I don't know if we could gauge what just happened as a success. Still, I came out of it pretty unscathed. As for my no-kill rule, well, those Paradise X guys were horrendous. As soon as they arrived in their three-vehicle convoy, they started causing crap. Some of them started taunting the townsfolk, while others swept the cabins. I counted nine of them in total. I think it hit a boiling point when one of them started groping a woman. That's when everything went to crap. I understood why Grilla was so adamant that we do this now. He was holding in some pent-up rage for sure. When he saw this, he stormed out of the cabin where they were going to hold the ambush and shot the guy down, who really wasn't expecting it. He took out two more before rushing back in, sporting a nasty bullet wound on his thigh. I'm not so sure why he was so good at aiming, if he'd never held a gun before. What happened next went by quick. In a life or death situation, all reservations you had about morality go out the window. I took shooting lessons as part of my training beforehand, so I managed to take out a few of them myself. I didn't feel anything when I did so. Things were looking pretty good until Christian blasted one of the soldiers point blank with a shotgun. He barely flinched. He was enhanced. Freaking hell, I remember Grillo shouting. He had told us that there was no chance they'd send one of them with the convoy, that they were too important. Well, that was bullcrap, wasn't it? The guy went on a rampage, picking people up and slamming them on the ground. Every punch that he threw was fatal. Slade had come out at one point to challenge him, but was dismantled easily. I saw him give a look of somber disappointment at Grillo before going limp. The whole plan was going downhill until Rust approached and shouted at the guy. Come here, you freaking wuss, was all that he said. I had no idea what his plan was. That is, until he took out a grenade. I guess he'd been hiding that. He took off the pin, chucked it at the guy, and watched as it bounced off of him. I guess Paradise X didn't use grenades, because the guy just scoffed and started towards Rust. At this point, Christian had already silently been gesturing everybody away from the whole situation. The grenade exploded right as the guy was stepping over it. Everything fell silent for a while. That's when we heard groaning. He was still alive. But he seemed to be incapacitated. A bunch of guys followed up by tossing him out of the settlement walls. I guess all the commotion had attracted something in the jungle because we heard screaming soon after. After that, we stayed around to help for a while, rebuilding and tending to any injuries. Least we could do. I had to thank Russ for what he did. The guy really had balls. When I did it, he just looked at me like I was insane. It was a fair judgment in retrospect. That was reckless, kid, he told me. I just nodded and asked him if he had changed his mind about coming with us. I doubted it, but it was worth a shot. He looked around the village for a second before sighing and shaking his head. No, no, I've got some work to do. And I don't think I'd be able to get it done wherever you're going. He patted me on the shoulder before walking away. Good luck, kid. Hope you find what you're looking for. Now, I don't know why, but that sentence filled me with a sense of melancholy. I guess it got me wondering what that really was. What was I actually after? Maybe I'm not so sure yet but that was just more reason to go and find out. Before we left, I watched Travis consoling a group of children. I'm really not so sure if us landing on the island did any good for this place. Everybody seems scared now, more than before. Whatever, there's no changing it now. We checked out the vehicles after. I'm not really sure what kind they were. Guess I wouldn't have known anyways. It sort of resembled an armored lifted jeep. Eventually, we figured out how to get them going. At this point, it was me, Grillo, Christian, Duke, Kaganori, another guard named Novex, and Lauren. She'd changed her mind. Could have been for a lot of reasons, but she didn't tell me. Let's just go, was all that she said to me when I inquired about it. We're all following Grillo now. Apparently, he knows where to go. He also stated that he had a plan once we got there, and there was an obvious hint of doubt wavering in his voice when he claimed this. We'll see what happens, I suppose. End of the entry. This is how far I've gotten up until now. I'm not really sure what to make of this, but my perception of Clint Rockwell sure has been dynamic. I don't know what to make of this guy anymore. I'll post again when I can. Bye for now. Hey guys, sorry for the wait. Let's cut to the chase. 
this was what Clint wrote next. Entry 5. I'm not sure what the hell's going on right now. I'm at the back of the convoy with Lauren and Kaganori, who's at the wheel. We were driving fine. Before we left, Grillo had told us not to look at anything outside the vehicle, and especially not to fire off any shots. There was a 90% chance that it wouldn't kill anything. I almost broke that rule when I caught a glimpse of something pressed against the window right beside me. It had pale skin and a wide open mouth that covered half of its face. I just shuddered and ignored it. Everybody else seemed to have the same idea. That was a while ago. However, Grillo just stopped completely, and nobody knows why. You see, the road, if you could call it that, is extremely narrow and he's blocking everything in front of us. Screw it, maybe he'll get going soon. Being out here at night is pretty horrific. I swear it's been at least 10 minutes and he still hasn't moved an inch. Kaganori's getting pissed. He wants to go out and see what's going on. Lauren's trying to convince him that it won't end well, since Grillo hasn't even stepped out, but he seems adamant. To be honest, I'm close to go checking it out myself. Duke just came out in front of us holding a rifle. He's walking towards something in front of where Grillo stopped. He's yelling at it now. He sounds pissed. What the hell is going on? Now he's raised the weapon. Grillo just stepped out and tackled him to the ground. They're wrestling now. Kaganori's run out to see what's going on. I need to know as well. I'll write down what happens later. Entry 6 Well, that was screwed up. I got there just in time to witness Duke putting Grillo into a rear naked choke. While he was gasping for air, Duke got up and started shouting again. Grillo was begging for us to stop him in between labored breaths. That's when I saw what was in front of the vehicle. It was Duke's copy, the one that we'd seen during the first days we landed on the island, although maybe it wasn't the same one. Duke was hysterical. What the frig do you want from me? He screamed at it. His copy just stood there, staring at him blankly, almost taunting him. Don't let him touch it, Grillo shouted at us from behind. I didn't know what to do in that moment. Neither did Kaganori. I could see Novex running up from behind us, but he seemed hesitant to do anything. We just remained passive observers. Duke was starting to get close to the thing. Very close. It looked as if he was about to throw a punch any second. I turned to see Grillo fishing a pistol out of the vehicle. What the hell are you doing? I asked him. He didn't respond. Instead, he just pointed the gun directly at Luke. Don't friggin' do it, he pleaded. Duke just ignored everything. That's when he raised a fist. Grillo got the shot off just in time. Duke's blood splattered everywhere as he fell to the ground. Nobody moved after that. We all just stared in anticipation, waiting for his copy's next move. I saw Kaganori slowly inching his way back to the vehicle. The thing stayed put. He just stared at Duke's body. But its facial expression was different. It almost looked disappointed. That's when its body started changing. It was hard to explain. I just remember it looking surreal. Its skin seemed to be bubbling and it was growing taller. Eventually, it started walking away backwards, at a speed no human should have been able to move at. As soon as it was out of sight, Grillo screamed at us to get back in our vehicles. We obliged. That's where we are now, driving again. Lauren's asking us what happened, but I don't really feel like reliving it. Kaganori hasn't said a word. I'll ask Grillo about it later, I guess. Entry 7 We finally stopped near a clearing. Grillo's gotten out of the vehicle and is signaling for us to do the same. Couldn't tell you how long it's been, but I'm cramping up. I eventually told Lauren what we had saw, but she had no response to it. She's just been staring at her lap. I'm not really sure why we aren't driving anymore, but I definitely see lights in the distance. We must be going the rest of the way on foot. I'm going to talk to Grillo now, see what he says. Alright, it seems he doesn't know much about it either. He's only being told what to do upon direct encounters with it. Apparently the number one rule is that you cannot initiate contact with it under any circumstances. As long as you're in its peripheral view, it can imitate your appearance perfectly. It'll also never attack you, given that you don't touch it first or take any action that may harm it, like running it over. You're just supposed to walk away from it. I asked him what was supposed to happen once you've touched it. His response was short and cryptic. That sets it free. We can't have that. I tried asking him what the hell that was supposed to mean me. I tried asking him what the hell that was supposed to mean, but he changed the subject. We gotta walk the rest of the way, he said. Can't pull up in the convoy. Grab all the weapons. This was disconcerting, to say the least. But it looked like I wasn't getting any further answers out of him. I just did what he told me to do. We started heading towards the clearing. Through the brush we could see the outer limits of the city. 
There was a big wall, looked like stone, spanning the place. There was also a large gate surrounded by guards. I could also see some buildings peeking out from the top. I'd nearly forgotten the sound of everyday city hustle at this point. This was a glimpse back into the old world. That's when Grillo dropped a bomb on us. He had no frigging plan. Apparently, he actually used to be a guard for Paradise X. However, he got kicked out for reporting the rampant misconduct his co-workers participated in. Yeah, it looked like this place was beyond corrupt. The other guards would beat and harass and rape their way all around the city with no accountability, and he got sick of it. He only came here for revenge. He was about to kill as many of them as he could before they stopped him. I never had guns before, he said with a twisted grin. They won't see it coming. Look, Grillo's a good guy, but this is madness. He told us that we could go back, that he wouldn't hold it against us. The problem was we didn't know how to get back to the settlement. Novex had a similar story to Grillo. He sure as hell wasn't helping us either. Well, it looks like we could either try and brave it in the crap show of a jungle, or hope for the best in this city. This crap's looking bleak. I'm listening to Grillo and Novex discuss the plan of action right now. Everybody looks horrified. Kaganori's got his face buried in his hands. Christian is praying near a tree, and I think I saw a tear roll down Lauren's eye. But, I seem to feel nothing. In fact, now that I think about it, I'm actually kind of excited. Is this just blatant denial of my situation, or am I actually going insane? Who the hell knows? The best thing I can do right now is focus on not getting shot. Apparently, they don't use the enhanced guards outside the walls. Again, they were too important. However, it seems like Grillo doesn't always know what he's talking about. All we can do is hope for the best. The plan itself was simple. Novex would put on a Paradise X uniform he took from the convoy and walk towards the guards. If he didn't get immediately shot down, he'd open fire. That's when the rest of us come in. With all the attention on him, we'd take care of the others. After that, we'd use the guard's keys to unlock the gate and wreak further havoc. Now, I'm not planning on simply walking around and slaughtering random guards. I wouldn't last a minute that way. I'll hide somewhere, let it cool off and explore the city. After that, who knows? It's not like I have much time to think right now anyways. Grillo's counting down already. He's got nine fingers up. Eight, seven, freaking hell. Entry eight. I don't know how I keep getting so lucky. I got skimmed by two bullets, but that was it. I'm hiding behind a dumpster in an alley right now with Christian and Lauren. I don't know where Kaganori is, but I know that Novex was shot dead by the guards as soon as he walked out there. We managed to get rid of the rest of them while they were busy with him. I remember seeing Grillo take a bullet in the shoulder, Kaganori in the thigh, and one destroyed Christian's ear. But this time, Grilla was right. None of those damn super soldiers were there. However, we were also pretty much out of ammo. It didn't take long before we heard shouting coming from inside the walls. After we unlocked the gates, we were met with a large statue of some dude with a hook for a hand. A bunch of civilians started staring at us as well. Here's the thing. I expected the quality of life in Paradise X to at least be decent. However, it looked horrendous. Everybody had bags under their eyes, and their tattered clothes barely hung onto their skinny frames. They all looked like disconnected zombies. The city itself looked like a post-nuclear Gotham. There were tons of skyscrapers, but they were foreboding and dirty. There were destute buildings lining the place, and every street seemed to be cracked. It was filled with what I assumed to be roving police squads, and the amount of people sleeping on the sidewalks was both astonishing and disturbing at the same time. I swear, I saw some dude getting the crap kicked out of him in plain view of everybody, and nobody intervened, not even the police. But that's probably because they were running towards us. However, they didn't have guns, only what looked like batons and knives. That's when Grillo went all out. He emptied the last clip of the rifle into a cluster of police before using it as a melee weapon. He was hurling loud, aggressive expletives at them while he did this. God, he really hated this place, didn't he? I needed to get the hell out of there. The last I saw of Grillo was him getting picked up and tossed into a windshield by an enhanced. I ran away from that whole situation until I was about to pass out. Civilians kept looking at us, but they didn't seem to give a crap. At this point, I still had three bullets left. I looked back to see Christian and Lauren not far behind. They also looked to be on the verge of puking. I didn't see where Keg and Nori went. That's where we are now, hiding behind this filthy dumpster trying to catch our breath. I don't know what we're going to do next. I don't know what we're going to do at all. I've killed so many people, but I don't really mind to be honest. 
Entry 9. Crap. A couple of cops are walking by us right now. We decided to hide directly in the dumpster, just to play it safe. My eyes are watering, Lauren just silently gagged. It smells like nothing I've ever experienced before. I'm not sure what I can do. I have a gun, and they don't. I could probably jump out and force them to give up their weapons. Maybe I will. Wait. I just noticed that one of the cops has a tattoo on his forearm. Could it be? Holy crap, it is. It's the Chicago Cubs logo. This guy's from Earth. Entry 10. Some interesting developments have just occurred. Whether they're good or not is left to be decided. I guess my adrenaline was spiked the hell up because I decided to jump out of that dumpster gun raised. As soon as I did, both cops rushed me. They saw that I was armed, for sure, but I guess they didn't care. I shot the guy without the tattoo before being taken down by the other one. I took a couple of baton blows to the ribs before he was restrained by Christian. He groaned, shouting at me in short, guttural bursts, Kill me. I don't care. I told him to calm the hell down. Then I laid it all out to him. I told him where we came from. That we were from Earth. His expression seemed to change drastically after that. He was listening intently. What happened to you, huh? How'd you get here? Christian eventually asked. As it turns out, he was a German-American named Kunz Steiner. He used to be part of the 82nd Airborne Division of the U.S. Army. One day on a mission to Iraq, some strange crap happened. The same crap that happened to us. It was a cloudy day, he explained. One second, we were up in the air. You know the rest. Only five of us actually made it into the island. I was the one who made it into this freaking place. Apparently he killed all the guards who were outside the walls at that time. I was running on fumes, he said. I didn't even know what the hell I was doing. I guess my primal instincts just kicked in. He also realized that bullets didn't do a whole lot against the jungle creatures, so he still had plenty of ammunition at that point. When the backup came, they wanted to just get rid of him. At first, but then they realized that he could be a valuable asset. They just lost like 10 freaking guards, he recalled. I guess they thought taking me in and turning me into one of them wasn't so bad of an idea, so that's what they did. Been here ever since. Can't tell you how many times I've thought about offing myself, he continued. Nobody should live in a place like this. His voice started quivering. But I always knew something could happen. Now you guys are here. I was a bit taken aback by this. I mean, what the hell was he expecting us to do? I asked him about it. Well, surely one of you knows how to pilot, right? Unfortunately, I don't. I thought about it. Travis was still back at the settlement. I asked him how the hell that was going to help, regardless. He looked around for a bit. That's when we all heard the distant sound of a boot stomping on concrete headed our way. Look, come back to my place first, I'll tell you about it there. So that's where we went, and that's where I am right now. You'd think that somebody as important as law enforcement here would get better living conditions. This place was beyond a crap hole. It's on the fifth floor of some dilapidated building that feels like it's going down any second. Apparently Coons only gets an hour of running water a day, and there's no air conditioning. 90% of his meals consisted of these stiff, brown energy bars. He gave us some. I almost puked when I saw something blinking back at me after I'd taken a bite. But this was his plan. He'd sneak us out of this place and we'd go back to the settlement. Coons knew how to get there, in order to pick up Travis, who would steer. Apparently the controls were similar enough to that of Earth's. After that, we'd go back to Paradise X, break into one of the hangars where they stored the aircrafts and fly out of there in search of the fog again. In search of the way back. Obviously, there was about a billion things that could go wrong with this. First of all, there were apparently only four small planes in that entire hangar, and it was heavily guarded. But he had a solution to that. He knew about 15 other guards who also wanted out of this place. That should be enough to break into the hangar, Kuhn stated. Over the years, he had told them about what Earth was like, and it fascinated them. Why they didn't just disregard him as crazy was simple. They were desperate for something else. Anywhere else. Everybody thought about doing it before, but nobody knew how to fly. This would be a golden opportunity for them. I thought about the guards that we had encountered earlier. None of them did seem to care about whether they died or not. But there was also Travis. There was no way in hell that he would come with us. He actually seemed to like it here. As crazy as it is, I can't see him willingly going back. And then there was the biggest problem. What if there was no fog to be found? Were we just going to drift around in the sky until our fuel ran out? I ran this by Coons, and he sighed. Honestly, anywhere is better than here. If we have to land somewhere else, then so be it. 
I'm not staying in whatever the crap this place is anymore. His tone was dead serious, expression unwavering. He was 100% committed to this. I told him we'd do it. Christian and Lauren didn't have any objections. I guess I'd also had my fill of this island. However, I really don't think we're going to find the fog again. Deep down, I know Coons doesn't either. This is just a coping mechanism for him. This is all he's got. It's currently morning, but we're going to leave at night. Easier to sneak out that way. I have to say, I'm still exhausted. I know I shouldn't be, but I am. We aren't going back to Earth. There's no way. Entry 11 It's finally dark out. We're going for it. Coon says that there's a hidden tunnel that we can take that'll lead us out. There's also a vehicle waiting for us, which one of the other guards has set up. Entry 12 we're driving back to the settlement now. Fortunately for us, this vehicle has blinds on the passenger windows. I decided that this would be a good time to ask Kuhn some more questions about Paradise X. As it turns out, the place is a sort of combination between a dictatorship and anarchy. There is technically somebody who runs and has power over everything. They call him the Pioneer. It's ironic because he has absolutely no contribution to discovering this place. Now this guy, he can make any laws he wants, but he doesn't. He just leaves the cesspool of a city to fester in its own waste. That's right, there were no actual rules against murder, or anything for that matter. The only real laws were that you couldn't attack the law enforcement, which was broken on an hourly basis, and that you couldn't step foot on the pioneer's personal property, where he and the ones close to him lived in relative luxury. This was a big deal. The punishment was supposedly worse than death. The only reason he sent out police at all were to monitor for any creatures that leaked past the wall. This wasn't uncommon, apparently. If they saw any, the regular police would notify what was known as the command operatives to come and get rid of them, which was mainly comprised of the enhanced guards. After that, I asked about the copies. I could see him become visibly paler at the mention of them. He didn't know too much about them either. He'd never seen one. In fact, nobody around him had come to a consensus on what they really were. Just don't touch them, he said, simple as that. I asked him what would happen if he did. Maybe he'd have a better answer than Grillo. Well, you know how they can take your farm just by looking at you, he responded. The thing is, when it's just staring at you, it's merely a hollow shell of yourself. But once you make contact with it, you're essentially giving it permission to become you. And you know, two of the same person can't exist at once. So after that, you're gone. I still didn't understand what the hell that was supposed to mean. I pressed him for more answers, but he left it at that. Nobody seemed to want to talk about these things. Entry 13. The rest of the drive was uneventful, but then we reached the settlement. It's really hard to say what happened, but a massacre obviously occurred. There were abnormally large claw marks scraped into the side of cabins, and bodies were haphazardly scattered everywhere. I tried not to look, because... there were kids. We searched the place for a while, but found no survivors. Eventually, Christian went back to praying, and Lauren just started bawling. I was, horrifically, transfixed by the whole scene. I don't know what to think anymore. Eventually, we found Travis's upper body. Safe to say the plan wasn't going to work. Coons cursed loudly and started pacing. I heard him mumbling. This can't happen. I have to do this. Hell, I can't stay here. At that point, I echoed his sentiments pretty closely. We really needed to get the hell off this island. But I never found any trace of rust. His body wasn't among the dead. I did find his journal, or what was left of it, anyways. Most pages were torn apart, and the rest was simply indecipherable. I tried analyzing it, but it just read like ramblings from a madman. However, I did find something interesting during the last few entries. He'd scribbled, This is a terrifying discovery. We... Before the page was ripped off. Crap. I wonder what the hell that's about. Let's go. Coons' voice echoed across the destroyed civilization. I asked him what the plan was now. I'll pilot myself if I have to. I don't give a crap. We're getting out of here. Entry 14. We're driving back to Paradise X now. Christian and Lauren just look disaffected now. Empty. Kuhn said that the plan was still on. It can't be that hard, right? He said in regards to flying. Yeah, probably not, I responded. He was obviously delusional at this point, but he seemed unstoppable. And I didn't want to piss him off some more. I really don't know where this is going. Entry 15. It's happening. Koontz has got out and notified everybody who wants in. The number's actually increased to 22 now, including some civilians. I asked him how the hell we were all supposed to fit. 
We won't, he responded. Not all of us are going to make it. They're all well aware of that. Well, that's nice to think about. I also asked him what he told them. About not having a pilot, he said that he didn't say anything. They probably would have wanted to help if they knew this. Just say that you're the pilot, he told me. Don't worry, you don't have to actually do it if you don't want to. I'll figure it out. He said this with such unwavering confidence. It was definitely just a facade. I could tell that he had no hope this was going to work. But screw it. There's always a chance. Besides, Dusk Blue really isn't worth staying on. Make sure you use those bullets well, he said. Every shot needs to count now. Entry 16. Screw me. So, this is what happened. We met up with the other 22 in some crappy warehouse. Coons introduced me to the pilot, or the savior, as he put it. It was really weird, honestly. They all cheered. Coons gave me a mini motivational speech about leaving this place and finding a home worth living. This got them all riled up. However, things were looking bleak from the get-go. Amongst us, we had about seven total bullets. Apparently, some cops like to smuggle weapons, but not many. We started marching through the streets, towards the hangar. A bunch of civilians and other cops stared at us in melancholic curiosity as we did so. The hangar soon appeared in front of us. The problem was, there were a lot more guards than we'd expected. I saw everybody's collective faces drop. Afterwards, we learned that somebody had sold us out in exchange for a week's supply of meat. Yes, some freaking meat. What Coons never told us was that the hangar was directly on the Pioneer's property. The next moments were a relative blur. The renegade cops charged the hangar with blatant disregard for their own lives. My vision was obstructed by red mist and bodies as I stumbled around. There was no way in hell that I was running into a sea of bullets, so I started scrambling out of there. At some point during the madness, I was clotheslined by some behemoth of a man. I blacked out soon after. I woke up after god knows how much time. I can feel turbulence. Guess we're on a plane. My chest hurts like hell and my legs are shackled to a wall. My weapon is gone, but the journal's still here. Great. I looked around the small space to find about six of the other cops and civilians who were there with us. Among them were Coons and Lauren. I guess Christian didn't make it. I called over to Coons and asked him where the hell we were going. As it turns out, we were headed to some kind of prison located on an island called Ghost Hazard. He said it so solemnly. Everybody around here looks so defeated. I'm so tired. Entry 17 I don't know what the hell Coons is trying to do right now. He seems to be trying to unshackle himself. I asked him what his plan was supposed to be given the fact that we were probably over an ocean right now. He just stared at me with a demented look in his eye. Hell if I know. Can't get locked up there though, he sputtered. I've heard the stories. Makes Paradise X sound like an actual paradise. Admittedly, those words disturbed me. I hadn't really thought about where we were going. If civilization was so bad here, I can't fathom what the prisons were like. Entry 18. Screw me. Somebody just came in. He's tossing everybody parachutes. What the hell is happening? Entry 19. This crap. It just keeps escalating. After the guard tossed us the parachutes, he opened the plane doors. A gust of wind hit me in the face as I stared out into the black sky. Coons asked him what the hell was going on. Low on fuel, the guard gave him a twisted smirk. Can't drop you off. You'll have to make your own way there. As he started unshackling everybody, two other guards soon materialized, rifles trained on us. One of the prisoners tried attacking the guard upon being freed but was shot quickly. He was barely acknowledgeable beyond that. If you jump out in the next 30 seconds you should hit land, the guard said. And I know what you're thinking. You could escape, huh? Well, there's nobody stopping you. But it's a small island, and you don't want to find out what's on it. You got a better shot at survival in the rift. Slightly, though. I'd later learn that the rift was the unofficial name of the prison. The guard shot me one last smug grin before walking up and unceremoniously pushing me out. I'd gotten my parachute on just in time. He didn't give much warning. As I looked up, I saw the other prisoners coming down, one by one. As we descended, I tried to scope out the island, trying to form some expectations. He didn't lie. It was small. About the size of a large shopping mall. There was only one compact concrete structure on the entire land mass. That couldn't be the prison, right? I thought to myself. But there wasn't much time for that. I was coming down. Fast. I made a judgment and opened the parachute. I eventually landed in shallow water near the shore. I tried taking a second to compose myself, but that's when I heard splashing around me. 
I turned around, expecting another prisoner. Nope. Instead, I was met with a mass of large, dark tentacles that pierced the water's surface, clamoring towards me. As I scrambled onto the shore, one of the appendages slammed down just a few inches from me, cracking the land. I made a beeline for the brooding forest in front of me. I estimated that I was about a ten minute walk from the prison. I seriously considered just not going, but then I really thought about it. There was nowhere to friggin' go. I jumped in every little sound as I made my way around the dense, black woods. At one point I thought I could hear a baby crying. As I kept listening, the louder it got, the more guttural and demonic it got. I got the hell away from that. Later I put my hand on a tree while trying to catch my breath. That's when I felt it move. I pulled away just in time to see what I thought was a just a whole materialized sharp, jagged teeth. About a second later, I looked behind me to see an abnormally large humanoid thing crawling towards me. Its three heads moved in a disturbingly erratic manner. Again, I bolted the hell out of there. Maybe about a minute later, I crashed into somebody. I freaked out at first, because who knew what the hell it was? But then I heard Lauren's voice. She was hysterical. What the hell is this place? She spoke softly, but frantically. Unfortunately, there was no time to talk. I could still hear that thing crawling towards us. I just pulled her up and told her to run. A while later, we stumbled into a clearing where we started getting shot at. Stop, a booming voice echoed. I looked up to see people wearing some kind of uniform staring at us in front of a building. This was it. A tall, threatening looking man wearing what looked like a suit of armor started thundering towards us. I braced myself for the worst but he just moved past. I looked back to see him sprint up to the creature and started strangling it. A freaking horrific sight it was. During the struggle, he called out to the guards. Prisoners, take him in. You saw the plane, lazy bastards. We were soon ushered into the dull structure. It looked like a crappy reception lobby. There were a few chairs and tables set up under flickering bulbs. More guards lined the perimeter of the place, with about one in five being armored. At the front, there was a small desk manned by some dude with one eye and no eye patch. He sighed and started typing. What surprised me was how advanced the monitor looked. Given everything that's happened thus far, I wasn't expecting that. While he did this, the guards searched us for weapons. One of them inspected my journal for a bit, but eventually gave it back to me. They didn't even get us uniforms or anything. After a while, the man behind the desk grunted and signaled towards an elevator to the side. There were about four in total. The guards pushed us in. There were too many buttons to count. They just pressed one near the top. The doors creaked shut, and we began our descent. After what felt like ten minutes, the doors opened back up and we were blasted by a cacophony of harsh sounds. Before this, I'd never really thought about what hell would be like. This prison was probably a good enough representation. The architecture was pretty similar to that of Alcatraz, if you've ever seen the interior. There were numerous rows of cells stretching upwards, and then I looked down at what appeared to be a black, endless fissure. It seemed like the deeper it got, the less lights were present. The most horrific screams came from the cells way below us that were nearly submerged into the darkness. The guards led us down the raucous corridor. I could see how scared Lauren was, but there really wasn't anything I could do to comfort her. I took a look into the cells that I passed by. Most of the other prisoners looked human. Some, I couldn't really tell. At one point, I saw Coons being escorted from the opposite corridor. We made eye contact for a second. His demeanor was a mixture of pissed off and terrified. The guards eventually pushed us into a small room and closed the bars behind us. That's when I took a look around. There were two bunk beds, but the sheets looked dirty as hell and were stained crimson. So were the concrete floors. To be honest, I didn't expect much better. I have to say, I did breathe a sigh of relief when I saw a toilet and a small sink. There were two other people in there, both men. I guess gender separation wasn't really a thing. But to be fair, I don't really see how they could accomplish that in a place like this. One of the guys suddenly sat up in the bed. I didn't know what to expect from the people here, so I was ready to take action if he tried to touch Lauren. But he smiled at us, a big toothy yellow grin. Hey there, name's Buck Lane. He had a comically stereotypical Australian accent, but he did sound friendly. He walked towards us, arms outstretched. We both shook his hand somewhat hesitantly. I questioned how somebody could be in a place like this and still have any semblance of cheerfulness, and I asked him that. He gave off a dry chuckle. 
Well, it's better not to think about it, yeah? It won't do you any good. That's how people go crazy. They think about things too much. I mean, really, what the hell is consciousness, even? He laughed again. Then his expression went a bit more serious. But, maybe I'm already there. I didn't really know how to respond to that, so I just nodded. I'd noticed that the other guy hadn't even acknowledged us. I guess Buck noticed me staring, because he chimed in. Oh, don't worry about him. He's harmless. Gone far off the deep end, though. Look at that crap he writes on the walls. I brought my gaze over to the wall near his bed. Sure enough, it was covered in writing. I saw a few lines like, Corruption engaged. There is no future. Before looking away. He did have a mound of pencils lying near his bed, though. Mine was taken away earlier. I asked him if I could take one, but was met with no response. I took it as a yes. We talked to Buck some more. As it turns out, he was also from Earth. But he didn't seem so surprised when we told him that we were as well. It's more common than you may think, he stated. People go missing in planes all the time. Where'd you think they'd end up? Here, whatever this place is. Hearing that gave me chills. For some regular commercial airline passenger going on vacation, only to end up here. That must be terrifying. Apparently Buck was the sole survivor of a crashed plane headed to Amsterdam. We didn't hook us, mate, he said. That's where I thought I was headed. His plane crash landed on what seemed to be a stone desert. He walked for days, eating peanuts, before he finally stumbled upon a civilization. There were some strange lunatics, he went on. Looks like weird rock people. I can't even describe it. He ended up flipping crap at the sight of them and ran away. Apparently, they took this as a threat for some reason, captured him, and put him in a small cage. He stayed there for days, eating strange bugs they served him before being loaded onto a plane and transported here. If all went to jail on Earth, they'd usually be a reason. Not here, mate. After that, he told us more about the prison. From what he'd gathered, it was pretty much a global screw-up of an institution. Individuals were brought here from anywhere. This place was absolutely massive. Ghost Hazard wasn't the only entrance. There were others as well. Also, the more dangerous a prisoner is considered, the closer their cell was to the bottom. This is freaking insane. For food, twice a day, guards would bring around what Buck referred to as nutrition blocks. I'm staring at one right now. It looks terribly similar to the energy bars Coons was eating at Paradise X. Safe to say, I have no appetite. Another similarity to Paradise X stems from the fact that this place was also essentially lawless. As long as you didn't attack the guards, steal food or resources, try to escape, or cause a general large-scale uprising, you had free reign. Nobody had any obligation to step into conflicts that didn't directly affect them. However, this is the part that really sucks. A good portion of the day was to be spent on manual labor. It was a lot of general maintenance work, but most of it was supposed to be spent down in the hole. A large cave system that had been dug through and excavated by prisoners for years. Nobody really knew what the point of it was. A lot of people just assumed that it was for discipline, but there were other theories. We're digging for something, no doubt about it, Buck exclaimed. One theory was that the warden, the individual who ran this place, was obsessed with finding something called the Neo Grail. Supposedly, sometime during this timeline's history, the original Holy Grail was corrupted by a powerful demonic entity during some kind of Armageddon. That was the reason why this world went to hell. However, the Warden believed that this wasn't the end of it. He'd studied various ancient books and scriptures, and had come to the conclusion that there was another Grail hidden somewhere in the vicinity of the prison. And that's why he went about building this place. When the Neo Grail was finally uncovered by a holy man like himself, the world would revert back to peace. But this was only one theory. Some think that the Warden has more sinister aspirations, that he's actually trying to start Armageddon himself. Speaking of the Warden, his history is shrouded in enigma. Nobody really knows where the hell he came from. He has a large office on the surface of one of the island entrances, but rarely comes down to the actual prison. There were a few alleged descriptions of his appearance, however. Not so long ago, there was a large insurgence around the lower levels. People were going insane down there. Eventually, a large enough group was formed to the extent where they decided they were a tangible enough threat to the guards. They started rioting, working up the levels, trying to get to the surface. Eventually, it was deemed enough an emergency that the warden needed to be called. 
This was a big deal. As the story goes, he came down to the lower floors himself, completely unarmed, and took out the insurgency single-handedly. According to the people that saw him, he was extremely tall, maybe around 8 foot 5. He wore a large trench coat with religious symbols stitched all over it. Then there were his eyes. This was contested, but they were allegedly pitch black, lifeless. Along with that, he looked young in appearance, despite the fact that he'd been around for a long freaking time. Also, nobody knew where the source of his strength came from. He could pick up a 200 pound man with one arm and throw him aside with ease. Upon being stabbed, the metal of the blade would just break off of his skin. Some people thought he was the devil incarnate. After that, the theory about him being somebody trying to return peace to the world became a lot less popular, especially after what happened next. What lurked at the absolute bottom of the prison was a mystery, while there being no lights down there and all. However, the survivors of the uprising were given a chance to know. Instead of them all being executed, they were given a different punishment. They were lowered by rope into the dark crevice. They screamed like hell and most of them tried committing suicide. They stayed down there for about a minute before being brought back up. They were deformed, but not in the traditional sense. Some of them had strange looking limbs growing out of their legs. Some had sprouted eyes on their arms. And some had no semblance of human features at all. I would try escaping, Buck told us, but you can probably see why that's not happening. For the first time, his cheery expression dropped. It's as if he just reminded himself of how bad the situation really was. But I had to know one more thing. How long are we here for? I asked him. I was scared as hell for the response. None of the guards had even said a word to us about this. Buck just sighed. I've never seen anybody leave me. Couldn't tell you, but don't worry about it. She'll be right. There was no confidence in his voice. I know. He doesn't believe them. I can hear guards opening up the cell doors next to us. Buck said that it's time to go into the hole. The workday was starting. But here's the thing. There's no way in hell that I'm staying in this place. I'll find a way out, if it kills me. Hey guys, sorry for the long wait. The job's been pretty unforgivable lately. I really had to focus on it this past week. However, it's been hard to do that. Especially after reading the next few entries of Clint's journal. This crap just keeps getting crazier. Entry 19 It's been one month and I'm already sick of this friggin' place. It's hard to find motivation to even write. Thought I'd give it a chance today. I gotta hold on to some semblance of sanity somehow. The rules here are screwed. If the guards catch you sitting down more than once while you're mining in the hole, you get pistol whipped. If you can't physically work anymore, you get dragged away and dropped down a shaft. It doesn't even look like they want to do it. I think they're scared of something. Scared of the warden. Following the days where we make slow progress, we'll usually be met with a new set of guards. Who the hell knows what happens to the old ones? Well, I have an idea, but whatever. The new ones are always harsher, but it's hard to blame them. I guess they have to be. I don't know how much longer I can keep this up. People drop like fragging flies here. I haven't had an opportunity to formulate an escape plan. Hell, I've got nobody to talk to other than Buck and Lorne. We don't get leisure breaks. We stay in our cell for about 10 hours before being herded to the mine. This is bad, but we'll see what happens. Entry 20. It's been around seven months now. I'm not counting. Buck is. He says that's his hobby. I mean, I guess there's nothing else to do. I'm pretty much sleeping whenever I'm not working. At least they're not starving us. The energy bars aren't bad, actually. I'd rather not think about what they're made out of, though. But still, nothing's freaking changed. I... I... I don't know what to do. It seems like the last revolutions made everybody complacent. Nobody's willing to take a chance anymore. Well, almost nobody. Two new guys were assigned to our section of the hole today. I eavesdropped on a conversation the guards were having about why they were here. I heard the word genocide drop a couple of times. Yeah, they were crazy screw-ups. As soon as they stepped foot into the working grounds, they went after the guards. Using only their pickaxes, they managed to massacre most of them before finally being shot down. This was an opportunity, obviously, but nobody took it. I guess everybody thought there was no chance of getting out, even if we managed to take out all the guards. To be honest, I'm starting to understand them. I don't want to think about it, but if my plan is to come to fruition, then we're going to need to face the warden at some point or another. And based off of the stories, 
That sounds like a frigging nightmare. Entry 21. It's been about two years since that last entry. I have to say, it's been pretty rough. I've had no motivation to frigging write anything down. I've teetered between bouts of depression and unresolved motivation. I don't think Lauren said anything in months. She just kind of sits around with a glazed look in her eyes. Just a corporal shell. I mean, I can't do anything about it. Buck's the same. Although I'm really starting to question his own sanity. There were a couple more work incidents. Just a few guards and prisoners killing each other here and there. In spite of that, more and more prisoners seem to keep piling in. The mine's starting to get crowded. A lot of the newbies complain, claim they didn't even do anything. That the whole system's corrupt. I mean, I believe them. Morality seems to go out the window here. But something happened recently. One of the guys who worked near me, Jackman, found something. And apparently it's what we've been digging for this whole time. You see, one of the few rules here is that if we find something that isn't pure rock, we're supposed to hand it over to the guards. Usually, there would be no way around this. They checked all of our pockets before we were done our shift. However, it's pretty obvious that the guards themselves don't really want to be here either. In fact, a lot of them are forced into it, mere prisoners themselves. Smoker was one of them. Not his real name, but you'd rarely see him without a dart dangling from his mouth. It was one of the few guard privileges. The name kind of caught on. Anyways, years ago he and Jackman came to a secret agreement. If Jackman ever found anything, he would be the first one to search him. You see, Smoker had inside knowledge, being here for decades. He knows what we're digging for, why the hell this prison even exists, all that crap. And he doesn't want any part of it anymore, but he can't leave. I started talking to Jackman a few weeks ago. We worked so close to each other that we'd sneak in conversations whenever the guards were out of earshot. Eventually, we both came to the conclusion that we were after the same thing. Freedom. Albeit, Jackson's been here much longer than I have. He's a bit hungrier. Also, unafraid of death. He was getting out of here no matter what. He told me about his alliance with Smoker and what the hell we were actually looking for. They were called Imperium Shards. Small, dense, white crystals that upon cutting yourself with would make you invincible for around 15 minutes. Keep in mind, they don't make you stronger, just impossible to kill. Enough of these could turn a mediocre standing army into an empire. And that was what the Warden was after. He wasn't planning on running this prison forever. No, he wanted more. That's why he forced us to all dig for 14 hours a day. But here's the thing. The Warden only knows the general location of where clusters of these crystals are supposed to naturally occur. Jackman actually knows how to find them. Before he'd been locked up, he was an excavation leader on a mineral-rich island. That was before something called neo came and ruined his whole operation, sending him here. They killed my whole team, he told me, but instead of taking me with them, they sent me here. As a F you to anybody who tries to take the resources that they think belong to them. And that's all of it. He was nearly foaming at the mouth as he said this. Yeah, I'll show those guys. I'll make them wish they killed me. Jackman knew how to mine, probably more than anybody else in this entire prison. That was how he caught the eye of Smoker. He wasn't digging at random like everybody else. He actually had a strategy. A few days ago, he struck gold. He'd found a few crystals. After the shift ended, Smoker pretended to search him. After that, he went to his cell, where he started a stockpile. He was in one of the older single capacity ones, so he didn't have to worry about people snooping around. He hid them in a discreet hole in the wall. We've been finding more and more every day. I've been storing some in my cell as well. I don't see Buck or Lawrence selling me out. And the other guy's insane, so whatever. I was a bit skeptical though. Crystals that make you invincible does seem like an outlandish idea. In retrospect though, I guess that thing's too strange for this world. I tried it out on myself. I made a small cut on my shoulder and waited a few minutes. After that, I tried stabbing my hand with a pencil. Safe to say, it works. Jackman told me to start recruiting anybody that I really trusted. A revolution was brewing. I've informed Buck and Lauren about this. They seem optimistic. The other guy in our cells? Still insane, so I didn't bother. But it seems like something's changed, and I can't friggin' wait. Entry 22. It's been about another six months. Our little group's growing to about 80. Most of the guards in our section are even in on it, through Smoker's persuasion. In addition, we've mined more of those crystals that we know what to do with. It's just a matter of time now. 
entry 23. It's been three more months. We've got 600 in on this now. We've pretty much convinced everybody in our mining section and they've gone and convinced their cellmates. All the guards in our part of it as well. There were some warden loyalists, of course. All we had to do is get rid of them until we found suitable replacements. However, we're going to need to act quickly. The original plan was to get 1,000 plus people from all around the prison, but we seem to be drawing in a lot of suspicion. We can't just kill all the guards who are here voluntarily and hold allegiance to the warden. There's too many of them, and they're getting antsy. Some cells have already been searched. They haven't found any of the smuggled shards yet, but there's no way in hell that I can hide all the ones that I have if they search mine. But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Entry 24 A few more weeks have passed, but we can't afford to keep going. Jackman got searched yesterday. Of course, there was no way he was hiding all the shards. So he just killed the two guards and stuffed them under his bed. We had to create a quick plan. At this point, we've got at least 800 people ready for this. We had to create an impromptu plan. It's happening tomorrow. Once the guards come around, unlock our cells, and start leading us to the hole, we strike. If they're loyalists, we kill them. If they also want out, well, the more the merrier. After that, we'll start making our way towards the surface. The elevators will probably get shut down, as they did during the last revolution. We'll have to use the stairs. I estimate that there's about 30 floors above ours. Shouldn't be a problem, though. According to the guards, there's a bunch of planes and boats on the surface of the main entrance that we can use to get the hell out of here. Where are we going next? I don't know. Baby steps, huh? As for the warden, he can't take care of all of us, especially if we have these shards. The last revolution was also considerably smaller than this one, but maybe I'm being optimistic. Guess we'll find out soon. Even if I don't make it out alive, at least I wouldn't have to die complacent rotting away in this crap hole. At least I'll have done something interesting. Entry 25 Well, that was screwed up. If I sound a bit discombobulated, it's because my whole body hurts right now. I can barely friggin' move. Anyhow, the plan didn't really go the way we expected it to. Let me explain. It all started during the middle of the night. I woke up in the dark to gunshots being fired off somewhere near us. That's when I heard our lock being opened. As it turns out, the suspicion had reached a boiling point. They decided to do a thorough search on all rooms. I scrambled towards my shard stash, managing to slash my wrist just as a guard started pulling me away. He took the butt end of a rifle and slammed it into my chest. However, I felt nothing. From the solitary, dim, flickering light bulb above, I could make out his face. One of pure shock. He shot at me a couple of times before I managed to disarm him. The other guard just ran away. I looked back to see Buck and Lauren waking up from the commotion. It was now or never. We filled our pockets to the brink with the shards before handing out. As soon as we did, the lights came on. The war had officially started. I watched as guards got tossed around and executed by the now invulnerable prisoners. I started running along the corridors while getting shot at from all angles, with Buck and Lauren close behind. We scrambled up the stairs, getting closer and closer to the top. It was apparent that the more and more we made it up, the more and more guards were being sent down. That's when I realized something. We could handle groups of three or four of them, but not an entire army. We'd get overwhelmed eventually. I picked up a rifle just in case. I think we made it up about 20 sets of stairs before we were met with the freaking cavalry. The corridor was congested with about six of those armored guards me and Lauren saw when we first landed on Ghost Hazard. Freaking hell, I remember Buck saying. What are they supposed to be? A bunch of them started trudging forwards, lugging along massive Gatling guns. I pricked myself with a shard again in anticipation. We ducked into a nearby cell just as the shells started flying. My hand touched something soft and squishy as I stumbled backwards into a wall. It was a prisoner's spilled guts. I had to shudder at that. My heart dropped when I checked my pockets. I guess most of my shards had fallen out at one point or another. Luckily, Lauren's were still mostly there. We sat for a while knowing that we wouldn't be able to move forwards, given the constant stream of bullets. They lasted longer than I'd expected. Eventually, Buck had enough. Screw it, he said. They can't do this crap forever. He stabbed himself with a shard before walking out, hands up high. I heard him say, come on, before being drowned out by the gunfire. I watched as he was slowly pushed backwards by the force. After a while, the stream of ammunition stopped. We rushed out of the cell just as Buck was slowly getting up. His clothes had pretty much been shredded away by bullets at this point. 
It was a strange sight for sure. However, we realized that a new problem was right there in front of us. Although the guards couldn't hurt us, we sure as hell weren't going to make a dent on them. And they also outnumbered us. I looked around to see the other prisoners being tossed down by them, into the void. Their echoed screams signified potential doom for us. I looked back in front of me to see the guards approaching. If they got a hold of me, they'd have no problem just throwing me over the rails. And I don't think the shards would have helped me with whatever the hell was down there. I guess Buck and Lauren also realized this, because they'd already started running the other way. However, their paths were quickly blocked by a couple more armored guards that had jumped down from a higher level. To be honest with you, I thought we were goners right there and then. I didn't see any way out of it. We backed into another cell right as the guards closed in on us. I was considering slitting my throat just to avoid whatever the hell was down in that pit when I realized that I couldn't. I'd cut myself with a shard mere moments ago. I just closed my eyes in preparation. I felt myself moving forward a bit before being shoved to the ground. I opened them in confusion. One of the other guards had dragged the one that was pulling me and pushed him over the rails. I watched as he went off to the others. It was a guard on guard fight. I didn't want to move for a while. I was just too stunned. Eventually one of the guards stumbled back into the cell where we were. He looked up at us, panting heavily. It was Smoker. There was blood running down his face. Shard ran out. This ain't gonna work, he uttered out. We gotta get the hell out of here. At that, I snapped out of my trance. All of us got up and started booking it down the corridor. I took a quick glance behind me to see two armored guards sprinting right at us, gaining ground every second. We were nearly there when Lauren was dragged back down by her foot. I watched in horror as she was lifted up, ready to be tossed at any second. That's when I heard a voice coming from above. Get out of the way! I looked up. Coons was standing right there. He looked half dead with bloody wounds covering a good portion of his exposed skin. Despite that, he was holding what looked like a large freaking rocket launcher. I did what he said, moving out of his shooting path. He fired it, stumbling back as he did. The rocket made direct contact with the guard, who flew backwards from the explosion right over the rails. The other one was close behind, meaning a similar consequence. Lorne went airborne, barely managing to catch onto a rail as she made her descent. She managed to pull herself up before screaming out in exasperation. What the hell? She took some deep breaths before composing herself. We looked back up at Coons. He just gave us a bloody smile. You got any more of those crystals? I could sure use one right now. We continue making our way up the floors. At this point it was me, Buck, Lorne, Coons, and Smoker, who was still in the armor. As it turns out, he and a bunch of other prisoners had managed to overpower one of the armored guards when they were still being sent down as singles. Unfortunately, Jackman died in the process. As for Coons, one of his cellmates had told him about the shards and gave him some weeks before the revolution. However, he quickly lost all of them when he was tackled by a mound of guards. Eventually, he fought them off, grabbing the launcher in the process. I looked upwards. There were only about four floors to the surface, but it was still pretty much war. We sure as hell weren't in the clear. Luckily for us, the amount of armored guards had drastically thinned down. With Smoker paving a way for us, we kept running. At this point, we were running dangerously low on shards, but it was the home stretch. We were almost out. However, I had this creeping feeling that wouldn't go away. This thing that just kept nagging at me. Deep down, I knew what it was. I looked at Smoker. There was definitely a look of fright and anticipation on his face. That's when it happened. A booming crash came from the other side of the prison. It was the Warden. Everybody had stopped to take in the massacre that was occurring some distance away from us. He was far enough away that I had to squint, but I could make out what he looked like. He towered over the regular prisoners. I think 8-5 might have been an underestimate. His skin was pale white and he had long, slicked back silver hair. His trench coat was bloody, sweeping along the floor as he moved. That was another thing. He was fast. I observed as he sliced through multiple prisoners simultaneously was wielding an extremely large sword that nearly resembled a butcher knife. Whatever prisoners that were invulnerable to the knife, he simply tossed into the blackness below. I snapped back to reality when the ground started shaking. I heard a deep, guttural roar coming from the chasm below. I guess whatever the hell was down there had been disturbed by the amount of bodies coming its way. At this point, the warden had completely finished off the prisoners around him. 
A stampede of people had started running our way, running from the warden. He looked in our direction. That's when I joined the herd. I made a beeline for the next stairway, pushing others out of the way as I did. As I started making my way up, I heard another loud crash and the subsequent sounds of slaughter that were too close for comfort. I took a quick glance back. The warden was maybe 10 meters away from me. He was probably 20 times that distance just seconds ago. That's when I got a good look at his eyes. You see, they weren't pure black like everybody said they were. They were dark, for sure. But there was also something else. When I caught his glare, I didn't feel like I was looking at one man. No, I felt the anguished eyes of thousands staring back. That's the best way I can explain it. Before I could realize what was happening, he charged at me. I think he tried grabbing me, but it didn't quite work out. Instead, I was flung onto the floor. I was met with sharp, unexpected pain. My shard had ran out. Still reeling from the sting, I looked around and located the exit. It was surrounded by dead guards and had prisoners pouring out of it at a torrid rate. My skin prickled as I felt a warm breeze for the first time in years. I ran for it, faster than I had ever done so before, ignoring the intense aches in my legs every time I took a stride. As I was nearing freedom, I heard another crash some distance behind me. I didn't need to turn around to know what it was. The warden was on the top floor. I stepped out on a what looked like a combination between an aircraft carrier and an industrial dock. I watched as planes and helicopters soared away. There were no more aircrafts on the ground, only ships docked at the edge. Amidst the crowd of people, I spotted Smoker and the rest of them. I called out to him. He turned to face me and gestured for me to follow him. We started running towards what looked like a smaller sized cargo ship. Eventually we made it on. There were roughly 20 other people waiting for us, including Coons, Buck and Lauren. One of them called out, that's enough, we gotta leave now. No, we can't yet, Smoker barked back at him. He turned to me and asked if the warden was still coming after us. I nodded. Crap, he shouted. He followed up by telling us that since we were in a ship, we wouldn't be able to evade him if he ever reached the surface. He will destroy each and every last ship that tries leaving this place. He said with a tone of desperation. I asked him what the hell we were supposed to do then. He sighed before speaking. Apparently, there was an absurd amount of explosives attached underneath the carrier. This was essentially a failsafe in case of a major disaster, like what was happening right now. However, since the guards were pretty much dead, nobody had detonated them yet. If we can trigger it, that would probably take care of the warden, Smoker said hesitantly. I asked him how we were supposed to do that. He pointed to a large bag of small objects resembling futuristic grenades. That should do the trick. All it takes is one person. At that moment, the warden burst out onto the strip. All the prisoners that were still alive had pretty much escaped at this point, so he instantly turned his attention to us. Screw me, Smoker said under his breath. Well, I guess this is it. He reached back for the bag of explosives, but they were gone. It's, it's alright, mate. We all turned to look at Buck. He had the bag slung over his shoulders and was holding a pistol. I was never much back on Earth, you know? He grinned at us. At least I'll go out with a bang. He hopped off the ship. You guys better get going, yeah? No need to thank me. Those were the last words he said to us, before walking casually towards the advancing warden. None of us knew what to say. We just knew that we had to get out of there. And that's what we did. We left without Buck. We watched as he held the bag of explosives up, almost tauntingly. The warden stopped in his tracks. He started backing up. The ship also started picking up speed. By the time we were a good distance away, we saw the explosion. It was a nasty one. A wave of heat hit us as we moved across the water. It's been a few hours now, and nobody said anything. Guess there isn't a whole lot to say. Or, they could just be enjoying the peace. It's quiet out here. Tranquil. I almost feel at ease. Almost. Where we'll end up next? Who knows. But I don't have high expectations. And Buck, I know you told me not to do this, but... Thanks. Entry 26. I've never really liked the ocean. The vast, empty nothingness that just spans out into an apparent infinity. It's one of the few concepts that's really bothered me over the years. But I've never known how bad it could really be. Until now, that is. The serenity of the calm sea didn't last too long, as Desh, the ship pilot, carried us along the black waters. I started feeling a sense of urgency in the air. I couldn't explain it, 
but I could tell that everybody else felt the same way. They all looked uneasy for some reason. I soon realized why. Not too far up ahead, there was an area in the water that was just a bit darker than the rest. It also seemed to be moving. We all just eyed it with caution, not entirely sure of what the hell it was. I don't think any of us expected what happened next, though. Something started rising out of the water. It was a ship. Almost looked like a submarine of sorts, but it looked old and rusty. Hard to understand how it was even still functional. As it bobbed in our path, Dash started steering away from it. At this point, our weapon selection was dwindling. We had about eight rifles, three pistols, bunch of knives, and limited ammo. Smoker still had the armor, but it was damaged to hell. There was a large cannon mounted to the bow of the ship, but there didn't seem to be any ammo for it. Safe to say, we weren't very prepared for an assault. The top of the ship soon opened, with a gloved hand bursting out. We trained the few weapons that we had on it. What I assumed was a man then propped himself up onto the surface of the ship. He was wearing what appeared to be a military diving suit. It got a bit stranger upon closer inspection, however. The suit looked to be decaying. It was old and tattered. I could see erratic eyes moving behind the cracked glass of the goggles. More of them started climbing up until there was nearly no room for them to stand on. That's when I noticed they were all carrying weapons. Most had rusty iron bars, while others had what looked like axes attached to chains. None of us flinched as we made our way past them. We weren't really sure what to do, in all honesty. As we moved parallel to their ship, they dived into the water and started swimming towards us. We shot at them, but the bullets didn't seem to slow them down. Even though I could see them penetrating their suits, releasing bursts of black liquid into the ocean. We soon lost sight of them as they swam underneath us. It only took me a second to realize what was going to happen next. I cut myself with a shard as I began to hear the sounds of something scaling the sides of the ship. Gunshots and screams soon filled the air. These things had made their way onto the deck. I watched as people threw everything they had at these marine nightmares. They shot, stabbed, and kicked at these things to no avail. I turned around upon seeing an axe bounce off of my arm. I took a knife and stabbed my assailant up and through the chin. That's when I looked into its eyes. They were a deep blue and didn't look any less human than mine. But I know that they weren't, at least not anymore. I pulled the blade out as it kept stumbling forwards, advancing towards me. That's when I decided to take drastic measures. I tackled it to the ground and plunged the knife into its neck. I felt the revolting texture of soft, decaying flesh as I cut my way around, eventually decapitating it. The body went limp, but the head was still twitching. As I picked up the head in preparation to toss it overboard, I saw the eyes blink at me. I would have felt something if it weren't so cold, lifeless, devoid of any soul. I turned my attention back to the rest of the action. Even though there were about seven lifeless human bodies on the ground, the assault had pretty much been quelled. I watched as Coons took the blunt end of a rifle and smashed it into one of those creatures' faces, pummeling it into an unrecognizable pile of glass and black, rotten flesh. Eventually, we'd incapacitated them and threw them all overboard. Again, we all just remained silent for a while. That crap was horrifying. The silence was soon broken by Desh, letting out an anguished cry. He was holding his forearm, which was cut open. But here's the bad news. A bit of the black blood that came from those things had seeped into it. Now he was the only one that knew how to steer this ship, so this was not good. We rushed him inside and quickly located what looked like an aid kit. Coons took out a bottle of clear liquid and gave it a whiff before dumping it onto the cut. Desh cried out again. That's when Smoker stepped in. No, I know what these things are. He vocalized with a horrific expression on his face. We need to cut it off before it spreads. We hesitated. Desh's eyes widened in intense fear. Smoker just looked at him. Trust me. Desh sighed loudly. <sighs> Screw it. As we made the amputation, I was starting to get afraid of Desh's screams attracting other things out of the ocean. We sterilized the severed limb before cauterizing it with a blowtorch. After about an hour, Desh claimed that he was ready to go again. He fished a flask out of his jacket pocket and took several large swigs. Took it from the warden's office, he said. Was gonna share it, but screw it. After that, we'd sailed for some more hours on end. At one point, a heavy fog started materializing around us. As we got ready for another assault, we started hearing whispers coming from nowhere in particular. 
dark, anguished whispers, saying things that I could have gone infinite lifetimes without hearing. Luckily, nothing attacked us. There was also an instance where we thought that we could see an island in the distance. As we tried heading for it, it started moving. An ungodly moan echoed towards us as it suddenly submerged itself into the water. Safe to say, this ocean was a peculiar place. Not somewhere you'd want to be, but interesting, nonetheless. About a few more hours passed and we're getting worried. We only had about five of those prison energy bars left for the 13 of us. We also had no drinkable water. To make matters worse, Desh's veins had started turning black, and they were protruding violently out of his skin. He was also sick, nearly slipping in his own puke every minute or so. From what I could tell, there were small worms writhing around in the vomit. If I turn into something, shoot me on the spot, he said to us in a hoarse voice that was much deeper than his natural tone. In the meantime, I'll get us as far as I can. I felt sorry for him, of course. But there's no time for sympathy. We needed to get onto land. A few more hours pass and Desh is barely alive. His skin was bulging in and out and he seemed to be having trouble standing up. But just up ahead, we saw land. It sat there just waiting for us. Then out of nowhere, Desh fell to his knees, projectile vomiting everywhere. I stepped back, away from the squirming creatures now slithering towards us in the revolting liquid. Shh, shoot me. Dash uttered out. We thanked him before fulfilling his request. One bullet and his suffering was ended. We watched as his body twitched a bit before ultimately going limp. The ship eventually drifted onto the shore where we hopped off. As we wandered around the sandy surface, we were hit with a metallic tinge lingering in the air. Obviously, this didn't mean anything good. Other than that, the island seemed pretty typical. Actually, from all the other places that I've been while here, this resembled Earth the most. Before hitting land, we'd rationed out the remaining shards among us. Everybody got two, except for Smoker, who got three. Fair enough, I suppose. As we headed into the forest, we started seeing animal carcasses everywhere, even ones the size of elephants. Their guts had been gouged out and left to the flies. The smell was horrific. After seeing that, we were on high alert. At one point, we'd come across a large tiger-looking thing and were prepared for an attack. However, it seemed more scare of us, if anything. About a few minutes later, we realized what it was actually scared of. We stumbled into a clearing and I could hear the sounds of something wet near us. It was quiet, but I strained my ears to make it out. It almost resembled somebody pigging out at a buffet. Then a few seconds later, I heard somebody call out behind me and suggest that we take a break. They said it in a rather loud voice. As soon as he did so, all the other sounds stopped. I noticed it. So did Smoker. Everybody else seemed oblivious. The foliage around us started rattling. Then all hell broke loose. These things burst from the woods and lurched themselves towards us. They were about three and a half feet tall and seemed to alternate between crawling on all fours and stumbling upright. Their pale skin had a reddish glow to it, and their ear-piercing shrieks made me want to deafen myself. They had a multitude of pure red eyes covering their face and large mouths full of razor-like teeth, but as horrific as they looked, they weren't so strong. As one tried to jump on me, I reflexively batted it away with my rifle. Even though I only used about half of my strength, the blow sent it flying into a tree. It let out a shrill cry before trying to limp back towards me. However, they weren't so easy to deal with in groups. I observed as they overwhelmed the other prisoners, tearing them apart with their teeth and claws. There were too many of them. I looked around and locked eyes with Coon, Smoker, and Lorne, as well as a few others. We were getting the hell out of there. In that moment, I'd forgotten about the shards completely and didn't bother using them. We started running with twigs and branches hitting us in the face every now and then. I took a quick glance back at one point. The creatures were barely keeping pace with us. Looked like they weren't so fast either. However, that didn't fix the fact that they kept jumping out from the woods on either side of us. I felt some of their claws dig into my skin as I flung them off. Eventually, we lost those things and broke out of the forest. However, that didn't mean we were safe. We found ourselves on another beach filled with people this time. Or at least that's what I thought they were at first. They were walking slowly, seemingly moving without any purpose. And then one of them turned around. There was only one word that I needed to describe them. Zombies. 
With grayish, decaying skin, rotten teeth, and sunken eyes, I wouldn't know what else to call them. It started limping towards us, with the rest following soon after. At this point, we were already tired as hell, but we had no options. We were surrounded in front and had the forest behind us. We were about to take our chances back in the woods when Lauren pointed something out in the distance. It looked like a cluster of watchtowers. That seemed like a better option, so we went for it. However, we knew that the shards wouldn't actually close up our already existing wounds inflicted by the forest creatures. That meant we couldn't get too close to the zombies. We all saw what happened to Dash. However, we also knew that we were running low on ammo, so the shots had to be precise. Every missed bullet was an inch closer to a horrible death. Eventually, we ran out and were forced to use the rifles as blunt weapons, which was dangerous as all hell. Nevertheless, we were getting closer. I was starting to make out guards sitting on top of the towers, and they seemed to be helping us by shooting at the zombies. Half of them had firearms, while the rest were using what looked like crossbows. I saw them throw down some thick ropes that I assumed were for us to climb on. As I got closer and closer to the tower, I could tell that it was fortified with metal. I watched as Smoker and the rest of them jumped onto the various ropes of the surrounding towers, simultaneously climbing while being pulled up by the guards. I did the same. As I pulled myself up onto the tower platform, the guards instantly pointed their weapons at me. To be honest, nothing surprised me at this point, so I just put my hands up. What I assumed to be their leader quickly told them to back down. I would later learned that his name was Brax. We don't know if he's one of them or not, another guard argued, still pointing the crossbow right at my forehead. Brax just scoffed. Is that a joke? Look at him. Look at his weapon. I asked him what the hell he was talking about. What was I supposedly one of? Neo Civitus was his response. Jackman had also mentioned them while I was in the prison. However, I didn't really feel like asking questions, so I didn't pursue it. Still haven't, actually. After that, I looked down at the ground. The zombies were all gathered around the bottom of the tower, making futile attempts to climb it. As I turned back around, Brax tossed me a padded vest and some forearm guards. You want to stay here? You gotta work. He gave me a toothy grin. Welcome to Dead Man's Land. That was the official name of the island. I looked around the tower that I was in, seeing beds and a water basin set up. And then I looked over at the other towers. Coons waved at me from one of them. That's when I really got a sense of the scope of this place. All of them were connected by narrow bridges that the guards used to get around and communicate with each other. And there were a lot more than I'd originally made out. There weren't only towers either. I also saw moderate-sized buildings and small houses propped upwards by metal support beams as well. Again, they were all connected. It was like a town elevated away from the horrors on the ground. But that's all I'm going to write for now. Today's been a crap show. Brax told me that I'm on guard duty tomorrow, and that's in about four hours. I need some rest. Entry 27. It feels like the days are getting shorter here, but that isn't necessarily a bad thing. The place looks nice at night. It almost feels surreal at times. A small, peaceful civilization that's just 50 meters up from absolute hell on land. I can hear the zombies moving around at night. You'd might think that it would make it impossible to sleep, but the sounds of distant footsteps touching the soil is actually somewhat ambient. And after all the hell that I've been through, it's a welcome change. You'll rarely hear about a dispute around here. Everybody has a job and they don't mind doing it. Hell, there aren't really many options. People need to eat and shooting down birds doesn't seem sustainable. That's why twice a week they'll send out a hunting team of five to seven in order to scavenge animals and plants. Remember those forest creatures I was talking about? Well, apparently they're like a delicacy here. I almost spat out the meat when somebody showed me what I was actually eating. Still, they aren't bad, I suppose. Other than that, not much to do around here. I've gone on about two of those hunting trips myself and they've been easy enough. I didn't really notice when we first landed on the island, but the zombies are real slow. If you keep a moderate pace, they won't touch you. As long as you tread quietly, they won't swarm you. That's why we're advised to only use crossbows, guns only in absolute emergencies. We've encountered a few strange creatures here and there. These include, but are not limited to, a tall, thin humanoid nearly resembling a stick figure and this three-legged thing with what I can only describe as a rotating head. Yeah, that one was a bit freaky to look at. I tend to pass the time playing cards with Brax and Smoker. 
I taught him blackjack. Didn't realize it was that hard of a game to understand. They seem to forget the rules every third time we play. Well, if anything happens, guess I'll write again. Don't know when that's going to be, though. Entry 28. I should mention that I'm not really keeping track of how many days have passed. I just don't see a point in that anymore, you know? But it's been a while. I met a local girl recently. I'd just come back from a hunting trip during which I'd saved one of the guys from getting his leg bitten off by a large crocodile-looking thing. Apparently this dude was the girl's brother. When you told her what had happened, she ran up and asked if she could hug me, which I thought was the cutest damn thing ever. She also doesn't speak English, so I got Brax to translate for me, but I have been spending a lot of time teaching her. In return, she teaches me her own language. It's one that I've never heard before, and rather tough to learn, but the way that she speaks makes me want to keep going. Maybe I just like listening to her talk. She looks to be in her mid-twenties, and has this dirty blonde hair and these light pink eyes that look absolutely stunning. She's great, to say the least. I don't know how else to describe it. Oh, her name's Jolin, by the way. Pretty similar to Jolene. From what I've gathered, she was actually born on the island, in a small village up in the mountains somewhere. One day, while she was still a little girl, her village was overrun, and her father tried to get her and her brother out of there. Eventually, he was killed by a swarm of zombies in an attempt to sacrifice himself so that they could get away. Her brother protected her the rest of the way, until they stumbled upon this place. She actually started crying while telling the story. I have to say, it feels nice comforting someone instead of killing things for once. It's funny. I didn't come here looking for love. In fact, now that I really think about it, I'm not really sure why I came here in the first place. Adventure, was it? Or was it just fear of living in an ordinary life? Well, I can safely say that I don't have to worry about that anymore. You know, I wasn't planning on staying here forever when I first arrived. But Jolin's making a good case for it. Even though we can barely communicate with each other, I've never felt such a connection, such warmth. In fact, I don't really like thinking about leaving her. Besides, I don't really see a way out of here anyways. But like I've said before, let's just see what happens. Entry 29. Last night was... interesting. To be honest, it might have been the freakiest thing I've ever experienced while being here. And that's saying a lot. I was having a nightmare, a nasty one. I was being chased through the forest by a naked woman with gray skin, and her face, it was just three large gaping holes where the eyes and mouth were supposed to be. It ran in this erratic, jerking motion that felt so unnatural I wanted to puke, and the frigging sound it made, it was almost like a low-pitched shrieking, nearly croaking, if you will. I remember finding myself standing up when I was awoken, being restrained by Brax. He was whispering at me to stop what I was doing. When I saw what he was referring to, I nearly had a heart attack. I was about to fall over the edge. I looked around and realized that it was too late for a few others. But the strange thing is, nobody was making a sound. They looked like they were trying to sleep, but couldn't, just laying with their eyes open. As I asked Brax what the hell was going on, he simply shushed me. That's when I realized that, even though I was awake, the shrieking was still there. It seemed to be coming from the forest's edge, so I looked over. What I saw probably won't ever leave me. It was the woman from my dream. She was standing in some kind of obscure, crouched position, screaming like hell. When Brax saw me looking at her, he pulled me away and quietly told me just to go back to bed until it was over. I complied. I remember lying there for what seemed like hours. In reality, it was only around 20 minutes. I started counting the time again in an attempt to minimize thinking about that demonic noise. When it finally stopped, everybody still stayed down. I didn't really want to get up either, so I did the same. It was only when the sunlight finally seeped in through the thick clouds where anybody moved. What I didn't notice during the night was that there were no zombies in our vicinity, in the vicinity of the woman. I'm guessing those two were correlated. Well, they were back now, feasting on the bodies of the people who sleepwalked themselves to death. There were some tears around the settlement that night. I met up with Smoker later that day and asked him about it. He was paler than I'd ever seen him before. He usually had a stoic demeanor, but not right then. He looked terrified. When I mentioned the woman, he just held up his hand and told me that the other guards had told him not to talk about it. That if we ever saw her again, just to avoid looking at her and act like we didn't know that she was even there. 
I made eye contact with Coons and Lauren as well, but their expressions told me that they also didn't want to be reminded of it. Couldn't blame them, to be honest. But for some reason, I still had to know. I went up to Brax and demanded that he tell me what that thing was. Hesitantly, this is what he told me. That thing, the woman, if you could call it that, they referred to as a colorless spirit here. Now, nobody knows what it is at all. They just know that you need to ignore it. You see, the first time that the settlement had encountered her was a long while ago, and they learned their lesson. When she came out of the forest and started shrieking that insanity-inducing sound, some of the guards started yelling at her, while others prevented the people from walking off the towers. Eventually, one of them ended up just shooting at her. That's when all hell broke loose. The arrow pierced her shoulder and she went silent. A few seconds later, she was joined by a hundred others that looked exactly like her. They ran towards the settlement, scaling the towers at a disturbingly fast rate. Nobody could do anything about it. About half the people there died that day. It would have been more, but they were saved by daylight. As the dim light bled in from the sky above, the colorless spirit started running back into the woods. From that day on, they realized that the best strategy for dealing with these was to simply ignore them. However, it hadn't happened in so long that Brax had forgotten to tell us anything about it. But now we knew. This was a bad experience, to say the least. As I write this, Jolin lies sniffling quietly in my lap, but everybody seems a bit more reversed now. More afraid to go onto the ground, but I suppose that this will change. We can't linger on this forever. Entry 30 It's been a while since my last entry. Hard to pinpoint an exact time period, but I'm thinking months. Anyway, it took a while, but things are finally back to normal around here. In fact, we've actually constructed some new buildings, specifically a bathhouse and a theater. It's been a good time. Me and Jolin ride our own plays and put them on for the children. They seem to like it. A lot more fun than throwing around balls, I suppose. We also reenacted Forrest Gump and even got Coons and Lauren to take part in it. They loved that one. I guess cinema really is an interdimensional language. Speaking of Jolin, her English has gotten a lot better. So has my Deser, the language that she speaks. Besides that, I don't know what else to say. Everybody seems happier. I'm getting there as well. However, Smoker seems to be the exception here. Whenever I try talking to him these days, he just seems irritable and jaded. I kept pushing for him to tell me what was going on, but he always says it was nothing. That was until yesterday. For whatever reason, I couldn't sleep that night. With Jolin curled up by my side, I slowly inched my way out of the bed. As I got up to take a stroll around the towers, I spotted Smoker on the other side, puffing a dart. I realized that I hadn't seen him doing that since we left the prison. I walked over to him and asked him how he still had the cigs. Apparently, he'd stolen a bunch of them from the warden's office and stuffed them into a bag. He'd been smoking only at night ever since. Don't really want to share them, he told me. I'd rather keep it under wraps. He flicked it away and I watched as it cascaded down right onto a zombie's head. It just grunted in confusion. Smoker followed up by sighing before looking me in the eyes. You like it here? He asked. I mean, I know you got your girl and all, but you really want to stay here forever? I thought about it for a while. To be honest, I really wasn't sure. I mean, this wasn't really an ideal place to settle down or anything, but there didn't seem to be any way out. So that's what I told him. He just nodded. I asked him the same question after. However, I already knew the answer to that. He chuckled softly. Hell no. You know what I want, kid? It's funny. Even though I was in my early 20s, he still called me that. I guess it had to do with him being nearly half a foot taller. He paused before continuing. I've had my share of this place, this entire world to be frank, and I don't want to be a part of it anymore. I just want peace, you know? I want to be in Neo Civitas. At this point, I'd been hearing about the place so damn much I decided to finally figure out what it even was. So I asked him about it. It's a bright place in a dark world, he told me. With all this hell around us, it's one of the only places where somebody can expect a semblance of normalcy. I mean, sure, this place is civilized, but look down. I did so, watching as the zombies meandered around. It's still screwed up. In fact, I don't think any place isn't, other than Neo Civitas. He followed up by telling me about what it looked like. It was an apparent paradise. Miles upon miles of glistening skyscrapers that lit up the dark skies at night. It sounded to me like a peek back into the old world I had come from. Problem is, it was damn near impossible to gain entry if you weren't already born there. Some time ago, an outsider could have gained entry through military recruitment stations set up across various islands in a northern ocean. 
As it turns out, Smoker had tried enlisting in their infantry when he was younger. He had made the long and perilous trek to a smaller, very dangerous peninsula where one of those buildings was set up. Despite all his effort, however, he barely failed the physical tests. The thing is, he would have been allowed to apply again a year later, but the government over there inexplicably barred any more potential outsider recruits just three months after. There were still a few other ways you could become a citizen, but Smoker claimed that those were not feasible for him. Him telling me all this reminded me of my times back at Dusk Blue. What if it was all a ruse like Paradise X was? What if Neo Civitus really wasn't all that great? He chuckled when I brought this up. I understand your concerns, he responded, but I've seen it. Inside the recruitment station, they had monitors set up displaying the daily lives of citizens over there. It may have been propaganda, but it was beautiful, and it looked impossible to be fake. He put his head down and sighed, as if this whole conversation reminded him of lost dreams. Whatever, I heard him mumble. We'll see what happens. After that, he just laid down. Guess there wasn't really much else to say. I followed suit, going back to laying down next to Jolin on my bed. I didn't really get much sleep that night. It got me thinking, is this really where I wanted to end up? Was Neo Civitus a possibility? Could I bring Jolin with me? Did I even want to do that? I don't know. It feels like I really didn't know anything anymore. Entry 31 You know what's freaking hilarious? It seems as if months will go by where nothing substantial happens at all, only for crap to get really interesting really quick. Some time ago, I started hearing talks around the settlement about a hunting group that went missing some time back. Not even too long ago, maybe about a week before we arrived, that's why these guys were so willing to take us. Apparently this was pretty rare, but not unheard of. When they did go missing, another team would usually find their dead bodies sooner or later, but not in this case. Either they went real far, or they were captured by something. Anyhow, when I first heard about this, I didn't think about it too much. I mean, it wouldn't really affect me, right? All that I learned was that I should be careful out there. However, Things got real crazy yesterday. It was my turn again to go out and scavenge for food and resources. This time I was assigned to a team with coons. Along the way, however, we ran into a bit of trouble. We ran into a swarm of those forest creatures again. I guess our subsequent shouting affected a bunch of zombies so they started chasing us too. We were in deep hell. We ran through the forest for a while, actually losing two of our guys before coons spotted an opening up ahead. We crashed through it coming into a rather large clearing. At this point, we'd pretty much shaken off the creatures, but the zombies, they were still after us. We lay low for a while, not making any sound in an attempt to throw them off. Eventually, we did, and they moved straight past the clearing. When we'd gotten our bearings together, we realized that we were in uncharted territory. Now, it's not like we never covered new ground before, but this time, it was different. When we really looked around and evaluated the area we were in, it became rather apparent that this clearing could not have formed naturally. There were flattened trees everywhere, and what almost looked like tire tracks on the ground, leading to a man-made trail. It was peculiar, for sure. We decided to follow the tracks. I guess that we thought it meant civilization. People out there who were no different than us, just trying to survive in this crazy world. As we walked along, we started noticing other interesting things. Stuff like sharp wires tied to trees, blocking the path, and what looked like improvised bear traps. It got really screwed up when wooden pikes with zombies, as well as other creatures' heads, started appearing alongside us. We'd started to realize that continuing on probably wouldn't lead us anywhere good. We were about to head back when a member of our group pointed out a head that was different than the rest, it was human, and apparently one that he recognized. Brax inspected it closer and confirmed that it did indeed belong to one of the hunters that had gone missing before we came. Now came time for a decision. We could keep going and find out what happened to them, and if there were any survivors, or we could go and turn back. It was a tough one for sure, as the leader Brax couldn't just abandon this discovery, but it was also highly unlikely that pursuing this would lead to any favorable outcomes. There were only five of us, after all. Eventually, we'd settled on going back and gathering more people, in order to give us a better fighting chance against whatever the hell this was. 
However, as soon as we turned around, we heard the distant sounds of an engine behind us, and it was coming up fast. We knew that outrunning it wasn't a possibility, so in a split second decision we backed up into the dark woods and waited for what was coming. Not long after, a beaten down vehicle came into our sights. I couldn't really describe what kind of car it most closely resembled. All I can say is that it looked rough. Like the type of thing you wouldn't want to see if you were by yourself on a desolate back road. As it got even closer we could make out more pikes with zombie heads attached to the roof of the thing. Safe to say, this didn't mean anything good. It stopped about 20 feet from where we were hiding. Two men got out, talking loudly to each other, like they didn't even care about attracting crap from the woods. As I got a closer look at them, it appeared as if they were wearing ripped plaid shirts with dirty jeans. Now this was surprising, for a lot of reasons. They also spoke with a heavy, unidentifiable accent, and their voices sounded coarse as hell. And like the car, they also looked rough. We watched not really knowing what to do, as they picked up old traps and started setting up new ones. At one point, one of the men picked up a small rabbit-like creature that had been caught and started howling in hysterical laughter. I didn't see what was so funny about it, but the other one joined in as well. At this point, Brax nudged me in the side. He pointed to the vehicle and whispered, we are taking it. But before I could even react, he jumped out onto the trail and raised his rifle at them. We followed after him, ultimately doing the same. Now we expected these guys to show at least some indication of surprise or fear or something, but no, they just stared at us for a second before starting to laugh again. What are you folks doing out here? I remember one of them saying in a stupidly obnoxious tone. It ain't safe. Did you know that? For anyone. As soon as he finished his sentence, he slipped a small knife out of his sleeve and tossed it at Coons in one swift motion. It stuck him in the shoulder before Brax subsequently shot them down. Coons cried out in agony as he removed the weapon. Now it didn't go too deep, but the tip of the blade seemed to be covered in a sticky green substance. Coons sighed when he saw this. Oh hell. Brax took out a bottle of water and poured it onto the wound, but Coons winced like hell and said that it burnt. It was obvious that we had to do something, but the problem was that we didn't know what. To make matters infinitely worse, we started hearing more engines coming from farther down the trail. We piled into the vehicle, but by that time, it was already too late. As Brax trying to figure out how to turn on the ignition, I turned around and saw the other cars approaching fast, and they weren't stopping. My head slammed into the windshield as we were rear-ended hard. As my vision went blurry, I heard gunfire being exchanged before feeling myself getting pulled out of the car and dragged on the ground. As I started coming back to my senses, the sounds of hooting and hollering filled the air around me. I looked around, seeing dead bodies on both sides before looking up at the person dragging me. He hadn't noticed that I wasn't unconscious yet, so I took out my spare knife and slit his wrists. While he cried out in pain, I lunged at him, sticking the blade right into the stomach area. As he fell limp, I realized that the two remaining people he came with were still engaged in a firefight with Coons. Brax had been shot dead. He was the only one left. While they were still somewhat distracted, I tried sneaking up behind and taking them out that way. Unfortunately, it didn't work. They'd noticed, and I was shot once in the foot, and another bullet grazed my hips. The good news was that Coons managed to take them both out while they were dealing with me. We both realized that there was no time to recover right then. As I walked over to him, I saw that he had two more knife wounds on his neck and thigh. They were also covered in green stuff. But before I could say anything, he just shook his head. Don't worry about it. Nothing you can do. I could tell that he was going pale, but ultimately he was right. There was nothing I could do. As we were about to hop into the vehicle again, I heard something, a sound, coming from the car that had rear-ended us. Almost like a muffled cry or something. I told Coons to try and start the engine while I went to check it out. As I got closer, I could tell that it was coming from the trunk. Cautious as hell, I opened it. And I couldn't think of anything that I could have found that would have been more surprising. It was Kaganori. I genuinely thought he'd died back in Paradise X. He was bound and gagged, looking beat up as hell. He was also missing an eye. He was stuffed in between two other limp bodies, but I could tell that he was still certainly alive. The look in his last remaining eye sent a shiver down my spine. He'd been through a lot. I got him out of the trunk and untied him. We had no time to talk as the sound of engines in the distance started up again. 
As we stumbled over to the vehicle we were going to use, Coons finally got it going. As we went in, Coons looked at Kaganor and turned to me. Who the hell is this guy? In between breaths, I just told him to go. I could see a large shadow moving around in the woods beside us, and the cars behind us were getting louder. He didn't need to be told twice. It's a good thing that Coons has a pretty decent memory, because we made it back to the settlement without problems and without being followed. After I explained what the hell had happened to everybody, I brought them to the infirmary. I only needed a few bandages. Here's the crazy part, though. Everybody seemed to recognize Kaganori. Said he was one of the hunters that had went missing. But before I could get an explanation out of him, he went unconscious. However, he's stable. Just malnourished. They're tending to him right now. Coons, on the other hand, well, he's not looking so good. His skin's nearly gone translucent and all of his veins have become varicose. Nobody knows how to treat him. Everybody's also in dismay at the loss of Brax and the state of Kaganori. I guess that it became evident to everyone that we didn't have only monsters to fear. Our fellow man wasn't so safe either. The only thing really keeping me sane right now is the company of Jolin. If she wasn't here, I think I might have lost it at this point. As you can tell, a lot of crap just happened, and I don't really like any of it. Especially with what Kaganori whispered to me just before he passed out. Rust found something. Something screwed up. We were wrong about this place. It isn't an alternate reality. It's our own. Entry 32. I've been having a hard time trying to wrap my head around Kaganori's words. It, 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 it couldn't be, right? I mean, how the hell could the world have come to this? Well, I didn't need to wait much longer for further explanations. Kaganori woke up a few hours later. After devouring some forest creature meat, he finally told me and Lorne how the hell he ended up here. As it turns out, he went into hiding in Paradise X, after our initial break-in. But since the whole city was kind of a mess to begin with, he was never actually caught. He tried staying hidden on the streets for a few days before he started going delirious from the lack of food in his system. Eventually, somebody stumbled upon him singing to himself in an alleyway. The guy took him into his apartment and fed him some energy bars. Those things were freaking vile, he told me, but you gotta eat something. The guy named Ace was nice enough to let him stay, but from the way that he described it, the place sounded like absolute hell. While there was no running water, it always scalding for some reason. In addition, AC wasn't really a feasible amenity, so they were sweating buckets in there. But the worst part was the neighbor. Ace explained that he didn't exactly know what it was in the room next to them, but that they weren't supposed to risk letting it out. That meant at night, they were forced to listen to something stomp around next to them while letting out a ghoulish wail. And for whatever reason, it only moved at night. Eventually, Kaganori started working at a food production factory in order to help with the rent. It was the same one Ace was employed at. It was easy for him to land the job because the staff turnover was staggeringly high. I almost gagged when he told me what those bars were actually made out of. Anyways, a few weeks pass and he finds himself walking home alone at night. Even though the place was lawless, crime surprisingly wasn't a huge problem. However, I guess it made sense. Everybody in that place was essentially a walking shell. Just a ghost wandering around in hell. Nobody would really bother trying to rob anybody else. It just wasn't worth it. As he's about halfway back to the apartment, he spots somebody up ahead. In any other instance, he wouldn't have cared, but this person seemed familiar. It was Rust. He came up to him and they started talking. They were both about as equally surprised to see each other. When he asked Rust how he got in there, his demeanor soured. Apparently, the settlement that we'd first stumbled upon years ago was decimated by the Paradise X soldiers. The reason was unclear, but it probably had something to do with our break-in. He said that he'd seen innocent children get slaughtered in front of his very eyes. This was not pleasant for me to hear, of course. I felt that I already had too much blood on my hands. Ah, uh, hell. Anyways, as it was about to be his turn, he tried reasoning his way out of death. He claimed that he had skills that could be useful to them. This was true, of course. The guy had three engineering degrees. After an extensive period of pleading, they decided to give him a chance. There was a helicopter that needed work, and nobody over there had the technical skill to do it. If he could fix it within a month, then he'd be spared. If not, well, you get the picture. It took him 29 days, but he finally did it. 
After that, he was essentially employed as a mechanical engineer. However, he wasn't planning on staying. He told Kaganori that he had something big in mind. What that was exactly, Kaganori would just have to find out. Rust instructed him to survive for two more weeks before meeting him at his place. That was all he told me, Kaganori stated. I just trusted him. There was nothing else I could do, you know? He waited, just trudging along for the next couple weeks before knocking on Rust's door. He didn't say much when he opened up, just told Kaganori to follow him, that the plan was already in action. He led him to the factory where he'd apparently been working at. The soldiers guarding it asked Rust who the hell Kaganori was. In response, he pulled out a nail gun and shot them both in the head. And since all that they had were batons, they couldn't do anything about it. Reeling in shock, Kaganori asked him what the hell he was doing. Rust just told him not to worry. But this was the only way out. They walked into the place and started heading towards the back. Once there, Rust swung open a metal door and they found themselves in a tight maze of corridors. This is when Rust told him to run. They maneuvered around the claustrophobic space, taking out more guards that were scattered throughout. After a while, they started hearing distant yelling and footsteps behind them. Kaganori yelled at Rust to let him know what the hell was going on, but he was just told to be patient. He soon realized why. About 20 seconds later, a thundering explosion could be heard from outside. As Rust would tell him later, he'd been spending his free time working on crude explosives with materials he'd stolen from the factory. He'd been discreetly setting them up near the barrier walls day by day, until it seemed enough to create a considerable entrance hole, a hole big enough for the creatures to get in. Eventually, they found themselves in a control room with a ladder leading upwards. There were two more guards in there, which Rust also took out. It was perfect because after that, he'd run out of ammo. They hurried up the ladder, sealing the entryway with scrap metal as they climbed onto a rooftop. There was a helicopter sitting there, about 10 meters away. This was the one that Rust had been commissioned to fix. You see, he'd been planning ahead for a while. Even though he'd essentially fully fixed it within the first few days he was here, he pretended like he hadn't. He did this in order to have more time to tamper with the controls, as well as asking around and trying to get a sense of what each button and lever did. In the back of his mind, he knew that flying away was the only way off the island. Eventually, on the 29th day, he'd figured it out completely. That's when he started planting the bombs. The thing is, even though he'd fixed the engine, it still took an exorbitant amount of time to power it up, about an hour and change. That's why he needed a distraction. If he just sat in the aircraft waiting, the guards would have easily gotten to the rooftop in time and smoked him. But thanks to the explosion, now they were forced to deal with the horrors outside the walls. As Russ started up the helicopter, Kaganori looked down at the chaos that had plagued the city. Monstrous abominations were rampaging the place, killing everything in sight. The guards tried quelling the ungodly assault, but to no avail. At one point, a large crocodile-looking thing started climbing up the walls to the roof, towards them. It took Kaganori about 22 swings with a baton before it eventually decided to crawl back down. About an hour passes before they start to hear banging coming from the rooftop entrance. It sounded like somebody was using a battering ram. Fortunately, the helicopter had taken off before they had to deal with it. As they ascended into the murky sky, Kaganori looked back down at the scene below. As it turns out, Rust underestimated how strong his explosives were. A huge chunk of the wall and the surrounding areas had been decimated. There wasn't even much movement on the ground anymore. Everybody was either dead or in hiding. That's when it dawned on him. Rust had just inadvertently killed a lot of people. A lot of innocents, in fact. He was about to say something when Rust seemed to read his mind and stopped him. Those people down there, they didn't have lives worth living, he told him. I just put them out of their misery. Kaganori didn't try to argue with him. Deep down, he agreed with him. He just didn't want to admit it. They flew around for a few hours before he finally asked Rust where they were going. In response, he just sighed and said he didn't know, but that anywhere would be better than Dusk Blue. Eventually, they spotted an island and decided to descend. The engine needed to cool down anyways, so Rust thought this was a better time than ever. The island itself was insane. Just off the flat shore stood mountains that apparently put Everest to shame. The whole place was full of them. At the base of the monumental Alps were what appeared to be vast open cave systems. They explored the place cautiously, 
not wanting to draw any attention to themselves. However, it seemed that there was nothing on the island at all, just them. Russ told Kaganori to stay back and watch the helicopter while he explored the caves. While he initially objected to this, he figured that it'd be safer on the shore than in the darkness of the caverns. Russ put together a makeshift torch with some scrap wood and disappeared into the entrance. Kaganori said that he waited there for what felt like hours. He was getting worried. Eventually, Russ finally surfaced from the dark. He seemed unharmed, but his expression told a different story. He looked horrified. He was also holding a small book. Kaganori asked him what had happened before Russ just handed it over. It was old and the cover was peeling off, but there was no denying what it was. A Bible. Kaganori had been Protestant for the longest time, so he'd essentially memorized the first few pages by heart. He read it over, and it lined up perfectly. Rust explained that he found it sitting in the middle of a crudely drawn symbol, like it was part of some kind of botched ritual or something. They just sat there for a while after that. None of them had any words to say. This was a troubling revelation after all. Rust broke the silence a while later. That wasn't it. Apparently he'd also seen cave paintings in there, along with pieces of what looked like torn manuscripts. He pulled them out of his bag, but they were all in Latin. Fortunately, Russ knew the language. From what he'd pieced together, something happened in 2026 that sent the world spiraling into what we were in now. It was unclear what this event actually was, however. The writings were all vague with words like corrupted and reborn popping up a lot. However, that wasn't even the most interesting part. The year 2014 also seemed to be significant. Russ's conjecture was that somebody had done something back then that took 12 years to fully manifest. Again, what really happened remained a mystery. All he had was the dates. There was one last significant thing that he saw in there. A painting of a map on one of the cave walls. It seemed to be an outline of the New World. Apparently, the only thing that Russ could somewhat recognize was North America and East Asia. The other continents were torn into pieces. However, there was one small island that seemed to be worth noting. It looked to be on the equator line, around where South America should have been. There was an arrow pointing to it, connected to a single word. Liberatio, Latin for deliverance. That's where we're headed, Rust exclaimed. Maybe we'll find answers. Kakanori asked him how the hell they were going to get there. I'll find out a way, was Rust's only response. Right after he said that, the ground beneath them started rumbling. They soon figured out why there was nothing else on the island. They looked over at the mountains behind them, and they were shaking, but it didn't look like an earthquake. There was a pattern to it, almost as if they were being caused by footsteps. Eventually, they saw something moving in the distance, something colossal. They didn't waste any more time, hopping into the helicopter and getting the hell out of there. As they left the island, Kaganori watched as a creature around double the size of the mounds made its way onto the shore. Since it was obscured by some kind of mist, he couldn't quite make out the details, but it was humanoid for sure. What disturbed him the most was the bellowing laugh that it let out afterwards. The voice was deep and guttural, sending ripples through the sea below. It was also sinister in tone, like it knew what they had just discovered. After that, they flew around for a few more hours before Rust admitted that there was a problem. He didn't know how to get to the island depicted on the cave painting. He suggested that they scavenge another island, in order to find materials for a compass. However, there didn't seem to be one in sight. They weren't low on fuel just yet, but that could change quickly. The situation got even worse when they flew into a brutal storm. Kakanori claimed that it had happened so suddenly. One second the skies were dry, the next, they were filled with heavy winds, rain, and lightning. It was inexplicable. But then again, in this world, that seemed to be the norm. It got so bad that Russ told him to put on one of the parachutes, just in case. There were no doors on the aircraft, after all. As it turns out, that was a good call, as a particularly strong burst of wind tilted the helicopter to its side. Kaganori's finger slipped from the railing he was holding onto, and he fell out. As he made his harsh descent, he tried to gauge what he was heading into. However, the rain had gotten so bad that he could barely open his eyes. He made a swift judgment waiting 10 seconds before ultimately opening the parachute. As he felt himself floating downwards, he started feeling the rain subside. 
He opened his eyes, being both surprised and relieved to find land waiting for him below. There seemed to be people on it as well, but as he got closer, he came to a horrifying realization. Those weren't people, or at least, not anymore. He made it to Dead Man's Land. After landing, he freaked out and started running away from the hordes of zombies that had now focused their collective attention on him. Eventually, he'd come across the settlement that we're in now. He'd been here ever since, going on regular hunting trips and establishing himself as part of the community. But about a year ago, he'd been captured by the psychos we encountered yesterday. As it turns out, they were crazy. They took turns torturing, toying around with him, as well as the others that he was with for pure entertainment. At one point, they were driving out, planning on tying him to a tree and letting the zombies swarm him. Fortunately, that was also when we crossed paths with him and saved him. He seemed to be getting lightheaded as he finished telling me this. The nurse told me that he needed more rest, so I let him be. However, he let me know one more thing before slipping out of consciousness again. I don't know if Rust is still alive. I don't know where he is. I don't know. I'm sitting here now pondering the implications of Rust's discovery. If this really is the future, then what the hell happened to 2026? How could that have led to this? What was on the island Russ was trying to get to? Were we ever going to get out of here? But like Kaganori, I guess I just didn't know. Entry 33 I woke up this morning to heavy commotion. Everybody seemed scared of something. I asked around, eventually finding out that some kind of machine had been shot down over the island just a few minutes ago. I walked over to where they were keeping it. Smoker was already there, holding it in his hands. It was small and compact, looking extremely futuristic, which made sense now. I asked him what the hell it was. He stared at me, eyes wide. Neo Civitus, he uttered out. This is a scout drone. They always send these before they're about to invade. Confused and shocked, I took a closer look at it. In big and bold three, letters four. was the phrase. It's been really quiet around here right after the drone incident. Everybody seemed oh, a bit confused at first. Not sure what's going to Although happen Smoker next. tried explaining the stuff nature of the new so them. far, they didn't seem to want to be believe one it. hell of a time. It took a few better, other people with the knowledge of the place to finally convince everybody that this was not good news. Smoker also went on to explain that the drones meant they could be coming in weeks or years. In other words, we could never anticipate their arrival. I asked them why they'd be interested in this place at all. Resources, colonization, he told me. Most likely resources, though. He seemed incredibly worried as he told me this, but I couldn't understand why. I mean, if the only thing that they were after were some resources, then we'd just let them take it, right? No problems there. No, he said sternly. They don't work like that. You see, nobody likes giving up their crap to an invading force, right? But nobody would ever even bother fighting back if they knew what kind of power Neo Civitus has. Problem is, most people just don't. That's why they always retaliate at first. The battle never lasts very long. He sighed, pausing for a bit before continuing. Here's the thing with Neo Civitus. There's never any paperwork with them. No deals, no negotiations, nothing. Wherever they go, they eliminate the native population, no questions asked. It's just simpler that way. Besides, most islands that they land on are incredibly hostile anyways. There's no risks being taken with them. However, even as everybody started to prepare for the oncoming assault, Smoker just scoffed at them. There's no point, he explained. Once they land, we're all dead. It's hopeless. So what are you going to do? Just give up and let them kill you? I asked him. He furrowed his brow. Nah, I'll be long gone before they arrive. There's a lot of dignified ways to die, but fighting a pointless battle, that just ain't one of them. I'll have a better chance out there as opposed to staying here. Carrying nothing but a small sack of rations, one rifle, and a few knives, he left just a few days later. He didn't tell us where he was going, but I'm pretty sure that he wasn't sure himself. Before his departure, he asked me if I wanted to join him. Despite the grim reality that seemed to be waiting for me, I declined his offer. I suppose that there was just a small part of me that thought he was bullcrapping about this whole thing. But in retrospect, that didn't make any sense. I guess I just didn't want to deal with the horrors out there on this island. I guess I'm just taking my chances. But Coons did eventually recover yesterday, so I guess that's good news. Entry 35 A few more months have passed. At this point, we've prepared to the best of our abilities. 
However, Smoker's words still linger for me. There's no point. What if he's right? Hell, why would he be lying? He left for freak's sakes. What's worse is that nobody's really explained it to Jolin yet. She's confused as to why everybody's so tense these days. She knows that we might have to fight some people sooner or later, but she has no idea what the scale of it just might be. I should break the news to her, but I really don't want to. Entry 36 A few more months have passed, but we finally come up with something. Smoker said that they're most likely coming here for resources, right? Well, this place is filled to the brim with zombies and other crap. That'll pose a nuisance for sure. Not the ideal area to harvest or mine. You see, the creatures here are mostly attracted to sound. The more we make, the more congested the ground below us seems to be. So here's the plan. We've stockpiled plenty of food already, enough to last us months. We'll start creating a lot of noise and draw a massive crowd of them over. The idea here is that once Neo Civitas sees this, they'll deem the effort to be not worth it and just leave us alone. It might work. Actually, I have no idea. It's worth a shot at least. Entry 37. It's going to happen soon. A few hours ago, about three more drones flew over. Two seemed to be mapping out the forests and surrounding areas while the third hovered around where we were. We didn't bother shooting it down this time. We wanted to see if the hordes of undead piled at the base of our towers. We wanted to convince them to call everything off right there. They left about five minutes after they came, so that's probably good news. Now we just wait and see. Entry 38 I don't know how long it's been since that last entry. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I don't even know where I am. It was about a week since we sighted those three drones when they finally came. Now I don't know what I was expecting. What the hell was anybody expecting for that matter? We were prepared to come face to face with the freaking cavalry, An army if you will. But no, it was a single aircraft. I could barely comprehend what it even looked like. It was futuristic but not in the traditional sense of the word. It was alien, otherworldly, not big, but beyond functional. It nearly resembled some kind of pod and moved with such smoothness you'd think it was being controlled remotely. As the shiny vehicle descended onto the shore about a quarter mile away from us, it started getting swarmed. It just sat there for about maybe five minutes. At that point, it had become buried underneath a pile of undead flesh. We were optimistic for a second. We couldn't fathom how they were going to get out of that, but then we witnessed the solution. The sound was sharp at first, gradually developing into a low hum. The pod emitted a light so bright that we all had to avert our eyes for a few seconds. As we returned our perception to the shore, we all went into collective shock. The zombies had been cleared out. But that's an understatement. They were eviscerated. No limbs, no bones, nothing. Just a red mist lingering in the air around it. We didn't even know how to react. The undead that had been surrounding our tower started trudging their way over to the shore, attracted by the noise. The doors to the space age machine opened up. Out stepped three figures. Just three. That was it. They looked to be wearing some kind of armor, but they weren't the massive clunky kind the guards of the prison had. Like the ship that they had came in, it was advanced beyond our comprehension. They were sleek black suits that seemed to bend and twist perfectly with every subtle movement they made. Their helmets resembled futuristic gas masks, with two large circular eye holes that glowed with a menacing shade of red. The rifles they were carrying looked compact and deadly. They were also a very strange color. A dark bluish green that seemed to reflect every source of light that bounced off it. They walked for about five seconds before ascending into the air. It looked so seamless. Their boots didn't even seem to have any thrusters, so it was unclear how this was possible. As they floated towards us, they dropped tiny blue orbs onto the ground below. As soon as they landed, every zombie within our perceivable vicinity appeared to start being electrocuted. Albeit not for long. They dropped in seconds. As the stench of burning rotten flesh filled the air, the super soldiers descended onto our towers. One landed just a few feet away from me. I saw what I assumed to be his name and position etched onto the barrel of his weapon. CPT Rizzer. I caught a glimpse of his suit up close. It was more intricate than I initially thought. It looked more like an exoskeleton than anything. It was outfitted with pistols and tasers amongst other things. There was writing on his chest in big white letters it read, Neocivitus Recon Division 34. 
He was also larger than any human I'd ever seen before. Larger than the warden, even. He must have been around nine feet tall. They didn't move at first, seemingly just observing us. At this point, I was holding on to Jolin tight. I also exchanged glances with Coons, Lorne, and Kaganori. It was almost a silent acknowledgement. We'd been through so much together. If these were our last moments alive, we wanted to make sure that we recognized this. I wasn't even prepared for what happened next. Before I even had time to react, I looked in front of me to see the barrel of Rizzer's weapon and aimed directly at me, or so I thought it was. I closed my eyes, bracing for bullets that were surely about to penetrate my skin. I heard the harsh, automatic buzz of the rifle, but I felt no pain. Instead, I only heard screaming from all around me, and warm liquid soaking into the side of my shirt. I knew what it was. I looked down at Jolin's limp upper body. Apparently, the rounds were so strong that they had cut her in half. Without being given even a second of time to grief, I felt a sharp, numbing cessation in my thigh. It eventually started to make its way up through my hips and then into my shoulder. I fell to the floor, hitting my head hard as I did. While I could still feel everything above my neck, everything below that seemed to be out of commission. I couldn't even turn away from the horrific sights in front of me. They were killing en masse. Women, the elderly, even children, without remorse. A few minutes later, they picked up one of the ones they deemed fit enough to survive and tossed us onto a single tower. Everybody else seemed to be affected by the paralyzing agent as well. I could see Coons and Kaganori out of the corners of my eyes, but no Lauren. We watched as the three soldiers walked around on the ground, planting what looked like small charges into the dirt. By this time, more zombies had wandered their way into the settlement area, but it would do less than nothing. Eventually, the soldier stepped back and one of them projected a hologram out of his wrist. I couldn't tell what exactly he was looking at, but I had an idea. He pressed some virtual buttons before holding up five fingers. Once they were all down, a mind-jolting explosion echoed through the air. Bits of dirt and zombie entrails flew everywhere, pelting us in the face. When the smoke cleared, we looked back down to see an enormous black pit in place of what was once solid ground. However, as I looked at it even closer, I realized that it wasn't empty space. It was bubbling. It was liquid. The first thought that popped into my head was oil. That was as good a guess as any, after all. Soon after, one of the soldiers flew back up to the tower we were involuntarily sitting in. It was Rizzer again. He took out a large syringe-looking device filled with dark red liquid. Don't squirm, and this'll hurt a lot. He injected it into a few guys sitting around me before I finally felt the needle plunge into my forearm. What followed was an intense burning sensation that seemed to last forever. However, I seemed to be gaining the feeling back into my limbs as well. A few of us tried escaping but were shot down without hesitation. The rest of us just sat tight. After he had finished up with everybody, he addressed us directly. You have two options here. Die or do manual labor. Seems pretty obvious to me. You guys might be pissed right now, but let me tell you that I do not give a crap. These things happen. As it turns out, we were forced to pump the dark liquid through tubes connected to this elaborate looking machine and then transfer them into metal barrels and finally load them onto a larger aircraft that would come around once a week. However, the liquid itself was a lot less viscous than oil. It also seemed to be bubbling indefinitely. Safe to say, I had no idea what it was, and I still don't. The only good thing that came out of this was that the soldiers had set up a moderately sized electric barrier around our settlement as to stop any additional creatures from interfering with our work. However, we also weren't getting out. They also provided us with food. Unsurprisingly, they were just more energy bars. However, these at least tasted decent. Other than that though, it was absolute hell. It was prison all over again. By the time the first month had expired, Almost half of us had committed suicide. In an apparent attempt to combat this, one of the soldiers announced that once we'd finished up, we would be given a place to stay in Neo Civitas. Most of us seemed to buy it, because worker morale skyrocketed right after he said that. However, I didn't. I'd always been good at reading people, and they were full of crap. They weren't planning on taking us back with them. They were going to waste us as soon as they'd got enough of that damn liquid. That was the only outcome that could have been waiting for us. I don't know why I didn't just end it myself. Blind hope, I suppose. But it was also something else. By all odds, I should have been dead at that point. 
Everybody around me seemed to be biting the dust, but I was still alive somehow. I shouldn't have been. I still shouldn't be. Something must have been working in my favor. Whether it was some kind of divine intervention or just dumb luck was irrelevant. It was doing the job for me. This train of thought kept me going. Somehow, I was getting out of this alive. Turns out, I was right. I don't know how much time had gone by when it happened. Must have been months at the very least. Or a year. I don't really know. One day we were working away when we started to feel the ground rumbling beneath our feet. We looked at the crater of liquid. At that point we depleted a considerable amount of it. It must have been at least a few meters lower than when we had started. The rumbling only got more severe. The soldiers themselves didn't seem to know what was going on. Eventually, it got to the point where we could barely stand up. The soldiers lifted into the sky, trying to make sense of it. The ground finally settled a few minutes later. All was still again. Without knowing what else to do, they just instructed us to go back to pumping. However, as soon as we flipped on the machine again, the ground beneath us started cracking. We all stepped away on instinct. Suddenly, an enormous black creature burst out of the ground. I stumbled back but got a better look at it in the process. It was a massive worm-like thing with slimy black flesh and sharp appendages sticking out at various angles. It burst into the air, lunging up at one of the surprised soldiers. At that point, all hell broke loose. The worm was followed by another, and then another. During the chaos, I remembered something. I had hidden the last few shards from the prison in a hidden compartment on one of the towers. I rushed up there to look for it. I found it just as soon as the tower started collapsing. I cut myself mere moments before hitting the ground again. I looked up, witnessing the surreal scene in front of me. My fellow prisoners were mostly dead, being swallowed up by the worms at a torrid pace. I saw coons trying to hop over the now broken electrical barrier before being cut open by one of their appendages. The three soldiers were throwing everything that they had at the creatures, shooting them down one by one, but they just kept coming up. As I was taking all this in, something hit me from behind and flung me into a tree. As I lifted myself back up, I saw one of the soldiers being overwhelmed. The two others seemed to shout something to each other before one of them took a rectangular device off his belt. He pressed one of the buttons on it before tossing it down onto the ground. As soon as they did this, they flew out of there, leaving their fellow soldier behind. At first I thought the device was going to be an explosive of sorts. I couldn't have been more wrong. I watched as it opened up and a dark, purple light began emanating out of it. It started growing and growing, engulfing the surrounding area. I started running when I realized that it wasn't stopping. However, as soon as I got up, I felt myself being tugged backwards. I turned around expecting to see one of the soldiers, but there was nothing there, just the purple void getting ever so bigger. I fell to the ground, clawing at the soil as I was sucked into an unknown fate. As the light consumed me, I felt weightless for a second. However, I couldn't breathe. I looked around only to see dark, vague shapes floating around me in a sea of purple nothingness. After about maybe 20 seconds, I blacked out. I awoke an unknown amount of time later, face down in what seemed to be sand. I groggily got up and looked around, but I could barely see in front of me. I was surrounded by what appeared to be a heavy, orange fog. It was pretty evident that I was in some sort of desert but every other detail was obscured. I only realized that my hearing was gone when it started to come back. That's when I heard the sounds of distant screams all around me. Suddenly, I could make out a shape in the distance. It was hard to tell what it was, but it seemed to be getting closer to me. Getting too close. It was one of those worms that had burst out of the ground. I jumped out of the way just in time to avoid it as it lunged towards me. I scrambled backwards as it buried into the sand. It slithered around trying to regain its bearings before it seemed to locate me. As it tried to lunge at me again, it looked as if it was being held back by something. It tried a few more times before a heavy, guttural roar emanated from somewhere just behind it. Suddenly the worm was dragged backwards and out of my sight. I didn't catch a glimpse of what did it. I got up and started running away, but I really had no idea where I was going. I didn't know what this place even was. About every step I'd take, I'd hear these ungodly sounds coming from every angle around me. Every time I'd see a moving shape in the distance, I'd change directions. It took a while, but I finally stumbled upon a ramshackle cabin. It was the first indication that humans must exist somewhere in this place. It was old and rotting, but 
but I was tired as hell, so I decided to go in and take refuge for a while. To my surprise, there was a bed in there, along with a pail of water in the corner. Although it was warm from the boiling temperature outside, it tasted like heaven to me. That's where I am right now. After writing this down, I'm going to need to pass out. I'm so tired. I don't know how the hell I got here. Maybe that device the soldier threw down was a teleportation mechanism of sorts. If it was, then where did it take me to? Entry 40. Frig, I need to get out of here. But where am I going to go? Damn it. I woke up about 20 minutes ago, not sure how long I've been out, but it's dark outside right now. And I can hear something outside. It sounds like laughter. Not human, though. It's so strange. It seems to come in bursts, and the voice is so guttural it knows I'm in here. Why else would it have stopped right in front of the cabin? Oh, frig this place. It's been hard to admit it, but I've been deluding myself this whole time. This desire for adventure, it's all bullcrap. It wasn't at the beginning, but things have changed. I want to go home. But if this really is Earth in the future, maybe home doesn't exist at all. I just heard something else. It sounds like gunshots and yelling. The laughter's only getting louder now. Entry 41. So, uh, a lot's happened. I don't know if I could call myself safe or not, but it sure is hell better than being stuck in that cabin. The commotion outside went on for another few minutes before some guys burst in, rifles aimed right at me. They must have been in their late teens. I didn't know how to react at first, I thought I was dead. However, they seemed as surprised as I was. After asking me some questions that I don't know the answer to, they destroyed some floorboards and fished out what I assumed were cartons of ammunition from underneath. They told me to come with them and we hopped into an extremely run-down dune buggy before driving off. Before we left, I got a glimpse of what had been making those laughing noises. God, I really wish I hadn't. It looked like a giant spider with too many legs, but with a human face. As we drove through the desolate, hellish landscape, I asked one of them what the hell this place was. I expected him to be surprised at me asking such a seemingly ridiculous question. However, he didn't even hesitate. Heaven's curse, that's what they call it anyways, he told me. In other words, this is hell. I didn't get any of their names. They never bothered to tell me. Right now I'm inside some kind of walled outpost. I don't know how many people are here. Must be thousands though. The weird thing is, most of them are children, and nobody looks past 40. I didn't get much of an introduction. Everything's moving so fast now. I keep asking everybody what this place is, but nobody seems to want to talk to me. Heaven's Curse, Station 26. I only ever get vague names. At this point, I've come to the conclusion that I must have been teleported. That device the soldiers threw, it must have taken me somewhere else. But where? Probably just another island, but it doesn't look like I'm getting a straight answer anytime soon. Right now, right as I entered through the gates, I was gestured up to a guard tower and told that I was to be a lookout from now on. What am I supposed to be looking for? I asked them. Anything that gets too close. Use this radio to contact somebody on the ground. Well, Frigg, I thought. Let me describe the place a bit better. You know how before there was fog so thick I couldn't see crap in front of me? Well, most of it seems to have dissipated around here. It's still present, but not enough to cause a considerable nuisance. The unexplainable part stems from the fact that there seems to be a barrier in which the fog is either heavy or light. In other words, there's literally a massive wall of fog that stretches up into the clouds sitting just a few hundred meters away from the barrier walls. Speaking of the walls, they look like they've gone through absolute hell. They seem to be made out of hardened mud, and it stretches upwards around 30 meters. From where we're positioned in the towers, we can see just over it, enough to make it with a vast, expansive desert in front of us. The outpost itself gives off a post-nuclear apocalypse steampunk vibe. What I assume are the soldiers, or guards, here wear really archaic looking scrap metal armor and use these firearms that appear to be powered by steam. The buildings here are mostly in shambles. There's a multitude of extremely run-down factories and buildings that are just dismantled for resources. Almost everybody sleeps underground, in these crudely dug-out bunkers. 
Safe to say, it isn't exactly paradise here. In addition to all this, the food situation is horrific. But I guess that's been a constant, so I can't be too surprised. It's not even that I'm starving, but my diet has turned into one consisting solely of tree bark and cooked insects. I never thought I'd ever miss energy bars. I'm currently doing 14 hour shifts. There's a few guys up here with me, but like everybody else, they don't seem to be the talkative type. I'd like to say that it's mostly uneventful, but it really isn't. Almost every two hours I see things. Now I've encountered a lot of creatures throughout the past years, but the crap I've seen from just a few days of being here, it's something else entirely. Most of the time they're quite far away, but every once in a while they get a little close for comfort. But that's when we have to use the radio. Just yesterday, we witnessed something in the distance, past the wall of fog. At first I thought it was some sort of aircraft. How wrong I was. The two other guys here with me seemed to know exactly what was going on because they freaked out and started screaming into the radios. Harbingers! Harbingers incoming! Confused beyond belief, I asked them what the hell they were talking about. However, they didn't even need to answer for me. As soon as the question came out of my mouth, they broke through the fog. I guess the best way I can describe them are small dragons. But as it got closer and closer, I realized that it was a lot worse than I had initially thought. It had these sharp spikes sticking out from all over its body. And I mean all over. None of them were the same size either. I barely had time to process this before it flew right into our tower and shredded the two guys I was working with. It set its gaze towards me before it was bombarded by a medley of firepower below. It flew down, barely sparing me from death. It took a while, but they finally killed the thing. It must have taken out at least 15 people before it finally went down, however. I expected everybody to be relieved after that, however they just remained more on guard than ever. I soon realized why. I looked back into the sandy plain and another familiar shape had materialized just beyond the fog. But this time, it was followed by more. I radioed them and started scrambling down the ladder. Staying there would have been a death sentence, and I'm not so proud of what I did next. As I hit the ground, one of the guards tossed me a rifle. I guess he was expecting me to help out in quelling the oncoming attack. I stayed for a while. I really did. But after witnessing the winged monstrosities tear apart human flesh like it was nothing, and the subsequent bullets of my low-powered firearm chipping away, slowly and slowly at the creature's horrendous spikes, I'd had enough. I ran for shelter. I found a locker in one of the factories and hid there until the sounds of carnage stopped. When I finally came out, I was inundated with the sight of mangled limbs, both human and not, strewn everywhere. I feared dirty looks as I came out, but nobody seemed to glance my way. I guess they didn't notice my act of cowardice during the action. I watched as several guards dragged the harbinger corpses away, tossing them down what looked to be a large well. Even after that grisly event, nothing changed. I just got my new watchtower partners and everything went back to normal. Nobody's even talking about it. This kind of hell must happen often. Well, great. Entry 42. Well, things just keep getting more and more interesting. The day right after the Harbinger's incident, there was another attack. However, this time I was right in the thick of it. I was sleeping when it happened. A guard shook me awake sometime in the middle of the night and shoved a rifle into my arms. We need every person out there, was what I think he said. Seeing no way out of it this time, I simply obliged. As I stepped out of my small bunker, I was blasted with the sound of combat. I surveyed everything, searching for the invaders. Now I know that I really shouldn't be surprised at anything I see anymore, but I flinched at the sight of them. They looked like knights. That's the best way I can describe them, but not regular ones. Their armor was pitch black as if it completely absorbed any light that managed to hit it. They were also extremely large. I caught the full scale of their size when one nearly snuck up beside me. It jabbed its pike towards me, barely missing my head. I looked up at the towering monstrosity in front of me. While it was completely covered in the armor, there were cracks and holes everywhere. I could see its skin through them. It looked to be a rotting light gray in the mouth. Man. Its helmet covered the entire face and the mouth was left exposed. The teeth were long and jagged, in addition to being dark red. There was also no skin around its lips. I was transfixed for a second before coming to my senses. 
I aimed the rifle directly at the creature and blew its jaw off. However, that didn't even slow it down. It kept advancing, thrusting the rusty spike at me every chance it got. I got another shot off at its helmet, which seemed to disorient it enough for me to escape. As I ran, I looked around and realized that this was a losing battle. The humans were dropping like flies, getting torn apart before being eaten by these abominations. But that wasn't even the worst part. The walls were breaking apart, the knights pouring in at a torrid rate. I don't even know how many there were. Too many to handle, for sure. I even saw some harbingers flying around, as well as what looked like fiery skeletons on horses. I knew this wasn't going to end well, so I decided to take refuge in a random bunker. I snuck my way down there expecting a bunch of others to have already been hiding. However, there were only a few guys there. They looked surprised as they saw me, but eventually gestured for me to come towards them. Hesitantly, I did. We gotta get out of here, one of them said. The other one broke apart a section of the wall, revealing a narrow tunnel. Emergency escape, let's go. I asked them where it was supposed to take us. They just shook their heads and responded in unison, I don't know. They disappeared into the tunnel soon after. I thought about it for a while before hearing the bunker door crash down above me. There were no other options here. I grabbed a small bag containing my belongings and I rushed after them. The problem with the tunnel was that it remained pitch black the entire way. I couldn't see where I was going. Luckily for me, it didn't seem to branch off and I was able to follow the footsteps in front of me. After maybe 10 minutes of running, I finally spotted the exit up ahead. I burst out looking for the two guys that I had been following. However, that's when I realized something. I was back out into the fog. Again, I could barely see in front of me. I heard some footsteps in the distance, but knew that it would be impossible to locate them. I was back to square one. This time, however, at least I had a rifle. I counted four more shots. I started walking aimlessly, looking for something. At one point, I stumbled upon and almost fell into what appeared to be a boiling river. However, as I got closer, I realized that wasn't the case. There were small creatures erratically moving around in the water, kind of like piranhas do when you drop meat near them. However, these were a lot worse than piranhas. When I peered over to see what was going on, a few lunged at me. I moved out of the way just in time and they landed in the dry sand. I got a good look at them while they flumped around. They were hard to describe, like a lobster squid mutation with too many mouths. Safe to say, I found another way around. I don't know how long I walked, probably only around half a day, but it felt like weeks. Luckily I packed a jug of water beforehand. I saw a lot of crap out there. I think that if I was transported here directly from Earth, I probably would have died in the first few minutes. But I seem to have adapted to hostile landscapes rather well. I managed to avoid any confrontations, the fog made it easier. A few times I inadvertently caught the attention of the entities roaming this place. However, I had learned that if I buried myself in the sand well enough, they wouldn't find me. These things were dumb as hell. It was when the fog had finally dissipated where problems arose. At one point I'd stumbled upon what seemed to be railroad tracks. Thinking they'd have to lead somewhere, I followed them. As I kept walking, I noticed that the fog was starting to thin out around me. However, that also came with the revelation that the desert wasn't as sparse as I thought it was. When the fog disappeared completely, I was suddenly thrust into the center of attention of every creature in my vicinity. And there were a lot of them. The good news was that I also saw something else in the distance. A wall. This time, it looked like stone. There were also armed guards on top of them. For a brief second, I made eye contact with one of them. At first I wasn't sure if they were hostile or not. I got my answer when they shot what looked like a large scorpion that started charging towards me. I started running like hell towards that barricade, nearly slipping in the sand a few times. If the guards weren't helping me out every step of the way, I would have been a goner in the first few seconds. As I got closer, I saw a small opening begin to materialize in the wall. I just ran even harder. I barely escaped, stumbling in as the entrance closed behind me. Unfortunately, one of the creatures also leaked in. It looked like a ghoulish, feral woman with giant, empty eye sockets. It started choking me, but was shot down by something behind me. I turned around, coming face to face with a large, burly man in tactical gear. He introduced himself as Crane, a soldier living at the settlement. As he showed me around the place, I realized that it must have been an old military base. There were tanks, hangars, warehouses, weapon depots, all of that stuff. 
There also aren't that many people here, and even stranger, barely any women. Crane sighed as I pointed it out. I don't know what's going on, he said. There used to be a lot of them, but they've all been dying. Must be something in the water here, or the air. Who the hell knows with this place? He didn't elaborate any further, almost like he didn't want to think about the grim implications of what that may mean for this place. In fact, they were ecstatic whenever they encountered a new person out in the desert. They weren't lacking resources, they were lacking a population. It sure as hell seems a lot more secure than the settlement I was just in though. They even have explosives here. Unsurprisingly, I was immediately assigned to be a soldier as well. I have guard duty tomorrow, back to that stuff. At least my bed here is relatively comfortable. The food isn't terrible either. They've actually managed to farm livestock here. They look rather unsightly though, like mutated boars, but I really can't complain at this point. Overall, the place is decent. Well, as decent as decent gets, I suppose. A strange thing to note here was what looked like a large pit in the middle of a pathway. It was barricaded somewhat haphazardly. I walked up to get a better look at it. I peered down, expecting to see a bottomless void. However, I was met with something else, almost like a thick gray mist of sorts. It looked ominous. I asked Crane about it, but he said he didn't know, that it's been there ever since he was. I'd stay away from it though, if that wasn't obvious. We hear noises coming out of it every so often. A lot of guys are scared something's gonna burst out of it one day. I mean, I'll take his advice. However, as I lie here, I ask myself if this life is even worth living anymore. The people around me probably don't have these feelings. I mean, this is all they know. But I've experienced the past. The old mundane existence that I hated so much suddenly comes into perspective. We clawed ourselves out of the Dark Ages for a reason. Entry 43 Holy crap, I just discovered something big. The guys around here tend to crumple up old papers and throw them around for fun. As I was walking around, I noticed one on the ground. I picked it up, trying to get a closer look at it. That's when I realized that it was a newspaper. I opened it up, hoping to get a glimpse back into the old world. Maybe start piecing together what the hell happened. What I read shocked me to my core. I couldn't make out many words, but I got the important ones. It was New York Times dated June 2003. This was the headline. Cold War escalating to dangerous heights, latest peace talks end in disaster, felt by all fronts. The Cold War? I must have stared at that headline for about an hour. The article itself was unreadable, but I still couldn't believe this. Was this a parody newspaper? It looked real to me, but it wasn't. Well, what the hell did that mean? After asking around, I found out that this place actually had a library of sorts. A place where old book records are stored. They said that if I wanted to find out more, to go there and talk to the guy running the place. That's where I'm heading right after I finish this. Entry 44 I had no idea what to expect from this library, but even that didn't stop me from feeling surprised when I finally saw it. Crane walked me over there after I told him that I wanted to see it. On the rather long walk over, he asked me about my past, what I had been doing before meeting him. Now it's obviously a long story, and one that's quite hard to explain, but I gave him the gist of it. I told him about the earth I knew, the clear skies, nature, civilizations, all of it. He probably thought I was mental, that I'd been through so much, I'd created this fictitious utopia in my head. He didn't say any of this out loud, but I could tell that he didn't believe a single word I said. In all honesty, I couldn't care less. None of it really mattered anyways. He led me to a singular, small, unassuming building surrounded by nothing. It almost looked like a ticker booth. I looked at him questioningly. He just gestured for me to go in. It's all down there, all that you want to know. The password is crisis. He walked away after saying that, leaving me alone to stare at the peculiar structure in front of me. I walked in through the small entryway and was faced with an opening in the floorboards. There was a ladder going downwards. I took it, descending into the darkness for about 20 minutes. As I hopped off the last rung, I found myself in what looked like a lobby with metal walls and floors. In front of me were large iron doors with an alphabetical panel to the side. There were overhead lights, but they weren't turned on. Instead, everything was illuminated by large candles. I entered the password, and they slid open. I can barely even begin to describe what I had saw. It was beautiful, 
to say the least. There were rows and rows of books and manuscripts stacked on pristine white shelves. There were breathtaking glass structures of historical figures set up on the sides and spiral staircases leading down to other floors. Again, the only sources of light here were candles and lamps, so it gave off an extremely ambient vibe that just made everything feel more stunning and surreal. I snapped back from my trance into reality when I heard a voice call out from somewhere behind me. I turned around, seeing a meek-looking 30-ish year old man staring at me in the confusion. I turned around me, seeing a meek-looking 30-ish year old man staring at me in confusion. I struggled to spit out the words, but I finally got an introduction out. I haven't seen you before, the man responded. Yeah, uh, I just got here, I suppose. He nodded. Well, I'm Voinov. After that brief exchange, we just stared at each other for a while. Eventually, I piped back up. So, what do you do? He smirked, gesturing to the books around him. I'm learning, constantly, piecing together the past, if you will. It's just you here? I asked. He nodded. Didn't used to be. I had friends down here, but they're all gone. Monsters, disease. It's tough to survive, you know? And the guys on the surface, they all got bored of this place. Can't read too well either, so it's just me. You said that you were piecing together the past, I asked him. So what happened? He went on to explain everything to me. Well, everything that he's figured out from reading, archiving, and analyzing the books and documents down here anyways. Apparently, the Soviet Union never dissolved in 1991 here. You see, in this timeline, the USSR didn't only take over Eastern Europe. Most of the West also went with it. In other words, they didn't grow weaker over the years, only stronger. In the Cold War, it wasn't only between the US. The Soviets also had China to worry about. The Kuomintang had actually won the Chinese Civil War here. That meant the Chinese Communist Party never came into true power, but even the Kuomintang didn't last too long. In 1995, China officially became a liberal democracy, meaning they had a lot more in common with the US than with the USSR. This was also around the time where the Soviets really stopped treading lightly. They were beating America in the space race and were now trying to beat them in the nuclear arms race as well. When China established democracy, the Soviets took this as a direct threat from the US and claimed that they were trying to impose their will on the rest of the world. Even though China had come to this consensus all on their own, the Soviets used this as an excuse to bolster their nuclear arsenal even more. Things were starting to become very dangerous. In response to this, China increased their own nuclear firepower and officially allied with the US. This move was highly contested by the Western European countries that remained free, notably the UK, France, and Ireland. They claimed that this would cause the Soviets to officially try and invade them. The situation started escalating even more. In this timeline, the Americans hadn't gotten a man on the moon until 2001. The Soviets did it two years later in 2003. The problem was, they had set up their moon base dangerously close to the US one, only about 200 meters away. They claimed that this was by accident, but nobody believed them. Things really started going to hell in the winter of 2007. France had been keeping the details of their own nuclear arsenal under wraps in order to avoid spite from the USSR. However, all of their plans were leaked by a Soviet spy working discreetly in Paris. To them, a hidden nuclear program meant war. They moved into France just a month later. News about the invasion spread across the world like wildfire. The Soviets ordered that the French give up their weapons and sovereignty, becoming part of the USSR. However, they didn't comply. The invasion lasted three months and would eventually be recognized as the inception of the apocalypse. The US, along with the UK, Ireland, Korea, and China all sent troops over there to aid the French. This is when they realized that the Soviets had been keeping secrets of their own with such a large portion of their natural budget going towards the military. They had developed new ground war weapons that caused ungodly devastation. Things like automatic rifles with explosive rounds, power armor, electric bombs, noxious gas that would spread too fast to be anticipated, etc. Because of this, the Soviets managed to take France with minimal casualties, even with international help. Things started to look terrible. In 2011, they followed up by also forcibly annexing the UK and Ireland. 
They even moved into the Middle East, destroying all of America's already established military bases there. World War III was imminent. About three years pass where no major occurrences take place. The Soviets knew that if they made a move on China, the US would be right on their heels. In addition to that, they would also be backed by Japan and Korea, which unified the same year that China turned to democracy. However, the peace didn't last. The following details were murky. All that can be confirmed was that when the Soviets decided to simultaneously send troops to China and America sometime in 2014, the nukes started flying. The east coast and midwest of America were destroyed along with central Canada. All the provinces in western China, as well as the entirety of Korea, were decimated. The Soviets also suffered heavy casualties. Ukraine, Belarus, and a quarter of Russia were irradiated. In addition to that, there were also some botched nuclear strikes that went haywire, hitting North Africa, India, and Central America. The world population plummeted that day, all in a nuclear war that lasted under a day. An estimated 2.8 billion people died, hundreds of cities were destroyed, the radiation ended up killing even more. The years that followed were miserable for everybody involved. The Soviet Union disbanded almost immediately after the war and the mass rebuilding of countries and cities went underway. Everybody tried to recreate a sense of normalcy in the world, but it could never really be the same. The apocalypse had essentially occurred. But that wasn't even the worst of it. In 2015, a high-ranking Soviet general was found hiding in a town in eastern Germany. His name was Elias Richter. He didn't put up a fight when apprehended by the newly formed International Commonwealth. His trial was set immediately and televised all across the world. And during the entire duration where the judge was reading out his war crimes, he remained stone-faced. That was until the very end. As he was about to be led to the electrocution room, he burst out laughing. It was a hysterical, nearly sadistic laugh. Everybody watched in shock as he began to speak. This was the gist of what he said. Apparently the Soviets had been developing an extremely experimental weapon since 1964. It was projected to be finished around 2035 but the sudden breakout of nuclear war caused them to consider deploying it then. They held a vote within a seven-person committee involving some of the top scientists who had been working on the weapon at the time, a vote on whether it was time to use it or not. All seven scientists voted against it. They claimed that the weapon was unfinished and therefore too unstable to be utilized. That could lead to unfathomable consequences if something actually went wrong. The plan was seemingly scrapped. That was until Elias decided that wasn't an acceptable decision. Most everybody, including his superiors, tried to stop him. But his intense, psychotic, militant desire to win the war, he started a mini-coup with a group of like-minded soldiers and launched it, to the dismay of everybody. What was this thing? Well, it was an antimatter weapon, a particle missile, or something to that effect. The details of what it really was remain a mystery for all time. The world would only know of its consequences. Apparently, this one weapon was enough to wipe out the entirety of America, most of Canada, and all of Central America as well. It was the end game for the Soviets. With the US out of the picture, China likely wouldn't be able to handle them on their own, but something went terribly wrong. The launch was botched and it landed somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. Everybody in the courtroom went into collective shock as he said this. If a weapon of that magnitude exploded underwater, then that could mean the apocalypse wasn't over. But Elias was quick to correct them. Supposedly, it wasn't an explosive. It was something else. Something that humanity wasn't ready to understand. It wasn't supposed to blow up America. It was supposed to get rid of it. He also didn't know when or if it would activate. But if it did, that would be the true end of the world. He didn't elaborate on what that meant. His laughter started up again, but it quickly turned into desperate sobbing. Tears streamed down his face and he repeatedly muttered out the words, I'm sorry. They interrogated him for a few weeks, trying to squeeze any info out of him. However, he just sat there and said that he couldn't help them anymore. They even tortured him, but to no avail. He died in 2018. The world feverishly scoured the Atlantic Ocean for years, but the task was seemingly impossible. They had an imprecise location and they didn't even know what they were looking for. That was until 2022. There was an object about the size of a small car lodged into the seabed somewhere in the northern Atlantic. The first thing that they saw was the red and yellow of the USSR flag. 
That was it. But nobody knew what to do with it. Upon closer inspection, the device had almost seemed alien. Nobody wanted to risk touching or operating on it. Things still weren't looking good. It was in the summer of 2026 when a breakthrough finally came. An American physicist and cryptologist by the name of Daniel Buchanan had discovered how to sift through the general logistics of the weapon without activating it. And in fact, he'd found something interesting, but it probably wasn't what he, or the world, was hoping for. There was a countdown timer embedded somewhere deep in the code of the device. It read 11, 07, 53, 22, 21, 20, 19. 11 days. This thing was set to go off in just over 11 days. The world fell into a frenzy. Everybody was at a loss for what to do. Beyond discovering the countdown, Buchanan hadn't managed to discover an off switch, or how to even begin to defuse it. It was just too complicated. And he was the brightest that the world had to offer. As the days leading up to the inevitable started winding down, a mass evacuation into underground shelters went into place all over the world. Nobody knew what was going to happen. People were still trying to defuse the weapon just four hours before it was set to go off, but they had made zero progress. All they could do now was to wait and hope for the best. A few military aircrafts overlooking the Atlantic stayed out in order to provide a live feed of what was about to happen. The helicopters didn't notice anything during the first few minutes after the timer hit zero, but then they realized something. The ocean surface was getting farther and farther away from them. That wasn't even the weirdest part, however. The water was also getting darker for some reason. They soon figured out why. Something was rising up from beneath the ocean. It was a landmass, an unfathomably large one. As it ascended towards them, they got a good enough view of the surface. It was nothing that should have come from this world. The structures, plants, creatures on that place, they all looked absolutely alien. The helicopters decided to take off, fearing what else could happen, what else they could come face to face with. However, as soon as they started flying off, a wicked roar could be heard coming from somewhere right below them. The pilots frantically shouted a few words before the feed turned into static. Now, only the top-ranking government officials ever saw this, so the general populace was still in the dark of what was happening on the surface. Again, nobody knew what to do. There was no way in hell that the depleted world militaries could have any hope in quelling whatever the hell had leaked into this world, so they just waited. But for what? Nobody really knew. At that point, the history became hard to track. There were scattered reports of strange occurrences happening in the shelters. Things like the ground splitting below them, strange creatures breaking through the ceiling above, and even other people morphing into otherworldly beings. The last recorded document present in the library was sometime during 2035, and this is all it read. We can't stay in here anymore. We just can't. The air's getting thinner down here for some reason, and we've been hearing these frigging moans coming from somewhere below us for months now. Yesterday, the floor started cracking, and a bunch of freaking eye stalks poked out of the rubble. They retreated back once we shot at them, but we know that it isn't over. We've decided to leave soon. Franklin's sending up a nine-person unit to map out what the hell's happening on the surface. I'm a part of it, but to be honest, I don't have high hopes. I was floored after hearing all this. I mean, I had no idea what to make of it, you know? What the hell are you supposed to think about something like this? God... I asked him about this library as well. It looks so nice. I don't see how they could have built it in such a place. He said that they didn't. Apparently they'd stumbled upon this settlement four years ago. When they got here, nearly everybody was dead. The ones that were still clinging on to life told them the password. They told them that the history could not be lost forever. Somebody had to know. This is so messed up. If those documents were accurate, it means that the world in this timeline was essentially ruined by one singular person. I'm going to need some time to process all of this. Entry 45 I don't know what's going on right now. It's the middle of the night and I just heard the loudest freaking sound ever coming from somewhere outside. I can't even describe it. I know that I'm pretty lucky to be alive at this point, but I don't think this is sustainable. Wait, I hear gunshots now. Oh man. Entry 46. Well, it's been crazy since that last entry. This is what happened. At first I thought about just hiding in my bunker when I heard the commotion outside. Just wait it all out, I thought. But then I realized something. 
If this settlement was destroyed, and I was the last one alive, well, I wouldn't be lasting long after that, would I? Conversely, if I decided to hide and they won, then Crane and the rest of the guys wouldn't be too happy with my cowardice. I made a decision, grabbed the assault rifle under my bed and decided to head out there. If I died, then I died. Was this life really worth living anymore? As soon as I poked my head outside, I was hit with the sharp smell of metal. I looked around, seeing blood everywhere on the ground, but no bodies. That's when I heard a deafening stomping coming from behind me. I turned, seeing what looked like a massive humanoid walking around, and when I say massive, I don't mean 10 feet tall, I mean over 100. It was picking up soldiers and crushing them into its gargantuan hands before slurping down their entrails. And its face, well it didn't really have one, its entire head was just one giant spherical mouth. As I watched, I also noticed that it had scaly skin that seemed to be shedding off as it moved. But no, it wasn't shedding. There were things falling off of it. I watched in horror as they spotted and started crawling towards me. As they got closer, I recoiled in horror. They were also humanoids, crawling on all fours. They looked feral with sickly gray skin, like the giant behemoth they, they came from. Their heads were also just one large mouth. They also seemed to be emitting some black gas that I didn't risk breathing in. I shot down about four of them before seeming to attract the attention of the big guy. I thought I was screwed. It leaped towards me, but I managed to duck into a nearby warehouse. After scrambling around in there for a few seconds, the creature ripped the roof off and tried swiping at me. Fortunately, I rolled away just in time. However, I sprained my ankle in the process and was left trying to scoot away helplessly. That's when I noticed something extremely disturbing about this thing. It had eyes, in the back of its throat. They seemed to be connected to some kind of appendage as it bulged out at me. I locked vision with it for a few seconds before it reached out again. Not knowing what to do, I just closed my eyes. However, instead of feeling my body being crushed, I heard an explosion followed by an ear-splitting, unnatural roar. I opened my eyes to see that one of the creature's giant eyes had essentially burst open. Another rocket from an unknown source hit the creature in the chest soon after. While it was distracted, I managed to get away. I must have killed three more of those smaller creatures before I ran out of ammo. I was limping around, trying to find somewhere to go. That's when I saw the pit that I had encountered when I first got there. I don't really know why, but my mind started racing and I hastily made my way towards it. Once there, I collapsed and peered into the murky mist below. Wait, I thought. Mist? Or was it fog? It looked so familiar for some reason. Another roar from behind me caused my mind to sift through my memories even further. Why was this so damn familiar? And then it hit me. How we first got here. Rust, the plane, the fog under the clouds. At that moment, I could swear that I heard something coming from the pit. Was it... Birds... I was hearing a bird chirp. I felt the ground start shaking from behind me and I knew this was my last chance. I pulled myself over the barricade and into the pit. I couldn't tell you for how long I fell through that gray void. All I know is that things went suddenly dark at one point and I felt an impact, but it wasn't hard at all. The area around me was soft and wet. I felt my hand come into contact with something slimy, squirming around, and got worried for a second. But that's when I saw what it was. An earthworm. The stuff around me must have been dirt. I started looking around frantically, trying to place where I was. Eventually, I spotted a light above me and started crawling towards it. I was on what seemed to be an upwards incline, so the climb wasn't too hard. Eventually, I broke out and found myself in a place that felt alien to where I had been for the last few years. Nature. I was in some kind of forest, and had just crawled out of a hole in the ground. It was foggy as hell, but I could see the trees, the bushes, the shrubs, the birds, all of it. I laid down for a while and fell into a state of euphoria. I guess somebody thought that I was crazy and walked over eventually, because I heard a voice speaking to me some while later. I opened my eyes to see a middle-aged man looking at me with an extremely concerned look. Are you alright? What in the bloody hell are you doing? He had what I assumed was a British accent. I would later find out that I ended up in Wales, Cardiff, to be exact. I tried to make some story up in my head, but it all came out in a jumbled mess. He walked away soon after that. Can't really blame him though, I must have looked and sounded like a madman. Eventually I found my way out of the forest and onto a city street. 
I stumbled upon a public washroom and cleaned myself up as best as I could in there. I wasn't really sure what to do beyond that, though. I sat outside on the street for a while. Even though I had no sign, I was tossed some change here and there. Eventually, I'd mustered up enough cash to buy a bag of chips and a pre-packaged sandwich at a convenience store. It tasted like absolute heaven. I devoured it in the store right in front of the cashier. I guess he saw my filthy, tattered jacket and my general unkempt appearance and felt sorry for me. What's a young guy like you doing homeless already? He asked me. I made up some story about how I flunked out of college while still owing massive student debt and that my parents wouldn't take me in anymore for that reason. I guess he bought it, because he offered me a job and a place to sleep in one of the back rooms. I started yesterday. However, I still have my suspicions about the world, so I did some research at a local library. I've got to say, though, the internet's changed quite a bit while I've been gone. Cell phones as well. It's kind of insane, actually. I've got a lot of catching up to do. Anyhow, my research yielded history that seemed to align with what I remembered, so that's excellent news. Out of curiosity, though, I searched up my parents' names. There were a few articles that came up. My dad had been killed in a workplace accident, and my mom had died a few years later from an apparent prescription drug overdose. Maybe it's better for me to not think about that too much. Actually, I think I'll end this entry for now. Entry 47. I've realized that I need to get back to California somehow. That shouldn't be too hard. I'll make enough money here to buy a plane ticket and then fly there. I'm not so sure where I'm going to stay, however. Hotels have gotten a lot more freaking expensive. I never even had many friends before I left. Well, I do have one. I don't know if he would want to see me though, or if he would even recognize me, but I'll give it a shot. Entry 48. I'm currently on a plane headed to Burbank. After that, I'll need to head over to Sacramento. However, I'm not sure if James still lives there or not. Hopefully he does. Entry 49. As it turns out, he was still there. I really wasn't expecting it, but it's great. Even better was that he welcomed me with open arms. God, he hasn't changed at all. As it turns out, his parents had moved back to Australia and they left him there with the house and all the mortgage paid off. Lucky bastard. However, I wasn't sure how I was going to approach our first meeting in around seven years. Obviously, I had a lot of explaining to do, but I wasn't sure if I was going to tell him the truth or not. Eventually, I decided to. I could see the shock and disbelief on his face as I told him what had happened to me. But I could also tell that he believed me deep down. He knew that I had no reason to lie to him. I barely got through any of my story before I felt the drowsiness hit me. James was nice enough to offer me a bed here, and that's where I am right now. I guess I'll continue explaining everything to him tomorrow, but for now, I'll rest. Entry 50 I told James a bit more about where I had been before he had to go to work. But now that I'm here alone, I'm left to contemplate something that I don't really want to do. You see, before we left, Russ had told me to do something in case we ever got separated in that world, and I found a way back here without him. I would need to go back to Caltech. There was this one lecture hall where he'd hidden something in a secret compartment in one of the walls. There were supposed to be another one or two items in there. A box or a box and a note. If there was no note and only a box, that would mean that he had not made it back to our world. If that was the case, I would have to deliver the box to a specific address. It was his family. You see, as eccentric as Rust was, he still loved his family deeply. Enough to ensure full financial stability for them before he left. However, he didn't tell them the truth about where he was going, just that it was a business trip. He always assumed that he was coming back, however, it turns out that this wasn't the case. I went to Caltech in order to retrieve the box before coming to Sacramento. I found it, but my heart dropped when there was no note. I opened the box to find a handwritten note directed towards his wife by Rust, as well as some addresses. He told me that after I delivered the box to explain everything to them, and to tell them that he was truly sorry. It looks like I'm going to have to do that soon. I've never been good at breaking bad news. Entry 51 James, this last entry is for you. I know that you're probably confused right now, but the best way that I can explain all of this is if you read this journal. I'm about to head off right now. I've taken some items from your house in order to help me on my journey, but I promise that I'll get you back later. You know I'm good for it. I'm sure that I'll see you again, my friend, 
but it might not be anytime soon. You see, there was somebody else Russ told me to contact if he didn't come back. He was a physicist who had known Russ since they were in college, but he wasn't based in Caltech. He worked for the government, for the higher-ups, if you will. Although he was also interested in the notion of a parallel reality, he wasn't ready to take on Rust's offer when he told him about his discoveries. It just sounded too far-fetched, and he didn't want his superiors to think that he was crazy. If I ever come back, Rust wanted me to convince him that it was real. Now, I always thought that this was an unreasonable request. After all, how was I supposed to change his mind? My journal entries probably wouldn't have even helped. I could have made it all up. However... I found something in my jacket pocket that I had somehow forgotten about during my hectic stint on Heaven's Curse. It was a small piece of one of those shards that we had mined in the prison. I'll go to the other address, the physicist, that Rust had given me in order to demonstrate the shard on myself in front of him. I don't see how he could doubt me after that. He'll probably even give me a job. You see, even though I never want to go back to that place, researching it from afar is still something that I want to do. Despite all that I've seen, all the places I've been to, there are still so many questions that have been left unanswered. I feel like it's my duty to find out, and also to find Rust, if he's still alive in there. Well, that was it. That was the end of the journal. What am I supposed to think about it? I don't really know. But I guess the world out there, it's a lot bigger than I had originally thought. And I'm not so sure if that's a good thing. <laughs>